Hey everybody, today we're debating is taxation theft and we are starting right now with our guest, Dr. Michael Humer, who's on the left side of your screen. Thanks so much for being with us and the floor is all yours, Dr. Humer. All right, thanks. Um, I'm gonna share my screen because I have a little slideshow that I prepared. All right, so I'm gonna talk about whether taxation is theft and my answer is yes, it is a form of theft. So this is what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna give a simple argument that taxation is theft. Then I'm gonna talk about objections to this. And then I'll talk about possible alternatives to taxation. And if I somehow have time at the end, I'll say some uh, side remarks about the distribution of the tax burden. So here's my simple argument that taxation is theft. Premise, taking property without the owner's consent is theft. Why do I think that? I think that's basically definitional. I don't know if that's the exact precise definition of theft, but it's something pretty close to that, right? Um, you know, obviously, if I if I took people's property without consent, if I like go to my neighbor and I go, hey, you have to give me, you know, 10% of the amount of money you made last year, otherwise I'm going to kidnap you and lock you in a cage and so on, uh, I would in fact be a thief. And you know, that's because I would be taking his taking his money without consent. Second premise, taxation takes people's property without their consent. The, uh, the taxation is not collected purely voluntarily, it's compulsory, right? They don't ask you, would you like to pay the taxes? Would you like to buy our services? They don't do that. They say, you have to give the money, otherwise we're going to send them with guns to your house to you know, kidnap you and lock you in a cage and stuff like that. Um, that is a non-consensual property transfer. And so conclusion, taxation is theft. And it seems to me pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, for some reason, most people don't like to call taxation theft. Uh, I guess most people think that that sounds really weird and um, you know maybe counterintuitive, but I find it hard to see how it how it could not be theft. All right, well, so I thought of some possible objections that people might say. Uh, so first objection, you know, thieves don't generally provide valuable services after they take your money. And the government does provide valuable services, which is why they have to take the money to pay for those services. My response to this is, well, that doesn't prevent it from being theft. So I'm not saying that they don't provide any valuable services. I'm just saying providing valuable services after you non-consensually transfer somebody's property doesn't stop you from being a thief. So as one example, um, you know, imagine that I'm running a charity and the way that I collect money from my charity is I, I just go out and mug people on the street. Okay, but after I take the money from them, then I feed it into my charity, which actually helps me. I would still be a thief, right? I mean, you know, I'm doing something good with the money, but I, it is still true that I stole it. Another example is the mafia, which collects money for protection. And by the way, in case you don't know this, they actually do provide protection and not just from themselves, but if another criminal starts messing with you, you can go to the mafia boss. If you pay protection money, you can go to the mafia boss, and they will fuck up the other criminal. So they are actually protecting you, which coincidentally is also the main service that the government says that they're providing for you, uh, that they're charging money for as well. And the fact that they're providing this service doesn't make them not thieves, right? What makes them thieves is that, well, they're providing the service, but they're not giving you free choice as to whether you want to pay for it or not. Here's another objection. Maybe it's not theft because we actually agreed to pay taxes. Uh, this would be following the so-called social contract theory, according to which government is established by some kind of agreement between the government and the people. Um, the main problem with this is it's just factually false. We just never, in fact, made such an agreement. So, you know, nobody can show, show me the contract that has my signature on it. There's no time at which anybody actually ever asked me, hey, do you want to have a government? Do you want to pay taxes? Whatever. Uh, and they didn't ask you either, right? They don't ask anyone. They just do it, right? Um, okay, here's a third objection. It's not theft because it's legal. Uh, you might say, you know, maybe theft is an illegal property transfer, right? Uh, and you know, maybe you think property rights are produced by the laws created by the government. And so the government gets to just say, you know, if they want some money, they just they just get to make the laws that say 
they're entitled to that money and then it becomes theirs. So it's not really your property, right? Okay, that's something you might say. My response to that is, well, property rights are not solely produced by government law. There are natural rights. So this is a hypothetical example. Let's say you go to some remote location where uh, it's outside the jurisdiction of any government. And there's this hermit living out there by himself. And the reason it's a hermit is there's no society so that you, you, know, you can't say that there's some other form of law there, right? All right so he's living out there by himself. And you know, he's created a sphere. Right, that he made from wood and stone and whatever. And when you find this hermit, you decide that you like his spears, so you just take it and leave. Right? Uh, we would say that you stole his spear, correct? Right? So, and that shows that you know stealing doesn't require there to be um, a government, you know, government jurisdiction, uh, and th you know doesn't require there to be a law created by a government. Okay. Objection four. Uh, yeah, but taxation is justified because we need it to maintain law and order, which is really important. Okay, <laughs> and my response to this is, again, that doesn't stop it from being theft, right? Uh, you have a theft if you have a non-consensual property transfer, even if you then do something really good with the property. Uh, my other response is, I think there might be alternative means of funding the government, so it might not actually be necessary to do taxation which I'm going to talk about in a second. All right, so what could the possible alternatives be? Uh, how, could, how could we provide law and order without taxation? Well, my basic idea is user fees. So if you have to have a government, okay, you know, side note, actually I'm an anarchist, but, you know, let's not go into that. Let's just say that you're, somehow you have to have a government for whatever reason. But still, maybe they could fund themselves by just charging money for the services that they're providing you know, just like everyone else who provides services and gets money. So in this proposal, they wouldn't simply force you to buy their service. They would say, we have a service. If you want it, pay us some money. If you don't pay us, we just won't provide you the service. We won't like kidnap you and lock you in a cage. We just won't provide our service. Right, so what could this be like? It might be, well, if you haven't paid your tax bill, right, it wouldn't be taxation anymore because it would be voluntary. So if you haven't paid the fees, uh, they would say, well, you know, you can't call the police. So if you call the police, they'll just ignore you. Uh, if a crime gets committed against you, they won't investigate it. They won't arrest anyone, right? You won't be able to use the government courts, whatever, you know, I won't be able to call the government fire department or whatever. So they could say that. And if the government services are super valuable and, you know, they're reasonably good at providing them, and if the prices were reasonable, then people would in fact pay. You might make this objection, you know, maybe this wouldn't be able to raise enough money to pay for all of the great social programs that, um, that we want the government to do. Okay, if you know that I'm a libertarian, you probably know my main response to this, which is uh, <laughs> we don't need all those social welfare programs. So uh, it might be true that you couldn't fund, you know, you can't fund everything the government is actually doing with uh, voluntary user fees, but um, that just means that you should cut back on all those programs. All right, now um, I, I remind you of my charity mugging example before where I was running this really good charity and I collect money by mugging people. Most people think that that's unjustified. Like I can't just go out and mug people in order to collect money, even though it's going to charity and, and the charity is good and valuable to society, right? Still can't do it. So I think that's like the government social welfare programs. I don't see why they should be able to force you to pay for them, even if they're good programs. Right. Which, by the way, side note, I think they're a lot less good than most private charities. OK, uh, so this is my you know, summary. Taxation is a non-voluntary property transfer, which is theft. Now, I'm not saying that that automatically rules it out as being unjustified, because I think there could be cases in which theft is justified. Like it could be justified in stealing something. In, in an emergency, if, you know, it's necessary to prevent something much worse from happening. But that does make it harder to justify. So it's not irrelevant that I say that it's that. It's not normatively irrelevant. It means that you need a special justification, you know, similar to the justification you would need if you were stealing, um, if an ordinary person was stealing somebody's property. Okay, um, am I out of time? Have I used up the 10 minutes? Okay. 
Oh, another minute. Okay. All right. Um, I was just going to make some comments about the way the tax burden is justified. And this isn't really relevant to whether it's theft or not, but I think it's interesting. I think that most people don't know about it. So this is a um, table that I made. This is data from the Congressional Budget Office in 2013. I haven't updated it lately. Um, but it shows um, they divided the population into five groups by income. So lowest quintile refers to the fifth of the population that has the lowest income. And the numbers in the table are averages, right? So 15,800 is the average income of people who are in the bottom 20% income group. And it shows uh, how much money they receive from the government as transfers. So social welfare programs that give you money or benefits and how much they pay on average in taxes. And then their tax as a percentage of their market income. And then the net tax is um, the amount of tax they paid minus the amount of transfers they received from the government. And what you see in the table is that for the bottom three quintiles, the bottom 60%, the average um, net tax is negative, meaning they're receiving more money than they're paying in. And it's only for the top two quintiles that's positive. And almost all of it is paid by the highest quintile. Uh, and these are people who, you know, on average, they make 250000 a year. So you probably pretty much call them the rich. So basically, the rich are carrying everybody else. This is the same data in a bar graph. Um, the blue is um, how much money uh, in absolute dollars they're paying. Okay. And um, so I just want to say this. Uh, the bot, this is a table with another row added, which is the portion of the total net tax that is paid by each group. And what you see is the highest quintile is paying 183% of the total net tax. Sorry, am I out of time? Okay. Anyway, just ask yourself, does that seem like a fair distribution? You got it. Thank you very much, Dr. Michael Humer. We will now kick it over to Dr. Ben Burgess and give a little bit of extra time on there. So we'll give Ben you the, uh, we'll give you the exact same amount of time for your opening. And so with that, thanks so much for being with us today. And want to remind you folks, if it's your first time here, Modern Day Debate is a neutral platform hosting debates on science, religion, and politics, including this juicy one you'll see on the bottom right of your screen between T-Jump and Vosh. Next week, the super straight debate. You don't want to miss it, so hit that subscribe button right now, as well as that notification button so you don't miss out on it. And with that, thanks so much, Dr. Ben Burgess. The floor is all yours for your opening. Uh, thank you, James. Uh, thanks, Michael. Uh, so I, I do want to start uh, by answering the question that we heard at the end. Uh, is it fair uh, that uh, the, uh, the wealthiest people pay many times the, uh, the percentage, uh, the average percentage? Uh, yes, of course it is. Uh, but uh, I want to, uh, we can, you know, we can get into that later, uh, you know, if, uh, if we want to talk about uh, why that is and uh, why they should be paying even more, uh, you know, and, and why that's no reason at all to think that they're paying an unfair percentage. Uh, but first, I want to talk about two questions that are more directly central to what we're talking about this evening. Uh, first is, is taxation theft? And the second is, is taxation wrong? And then finally, uh, is the, could the answer to the second to the first question, is uh, the second question, is taxation wrong? Be yes, because the answer to the first question is yes. In other words, could taxation be wrong because it's theft? Now, I'm gonna say that it's not wrong and it's not theft, but as a logically prior point, I do wanna say that even if the answer to both was yes, the answer to is taxation is wrong can't be theft because the answer to, you know, the answer to is it wrong can't be yes because the answer to is it theft is yes. It has to be the other way around. Uh, it has to, if the answer to both is yes and there's a relationship between those two answers, it has to be theft because it's wrong and not uh, not wrong because it's theft. Uh, I know that's counterintuitive, but we'll see if I can cash that check. Uh, but I think that saying that taxation is wrong because it's theft is like saying that abortion is wrong because it's murder. The concept of uh, wrongness is built into the concept of murder. That's why we don't talk about murdering enemy soldiers in a just war, or murder murdering a comatose patient who has to be murdered in his living will. And we certainly don't talk about committing murder in self-defense. Saying abortion is wrong because it's murder is a noisy way of saying that abortion is wrong because it's wrong. Uh, and adopting an argument that I got from Michael Brunig, I maintain that something uh, exactly similar is true of taxation is wrong because it's theft. Uh, and this critique is gonna apply with equal force to the moderate version 
of the taxation is theft claim that we just heard that, well, sometimes theft is justified in extreme circumstances. So maybe sometimes, you know, um, taxation is justified in extreme circumstances. It's going to apply to that just as much as the more hardcore version of the taxation is wrong because it's theft argument that says that it's absolutely wrong. So the position that we just heard, as I understand it, uh, says that the prima facie wrongness of, uh, of taxation can sometimes be canceled out by competing considerations. And a lot of you know, non-libertarians might hear that second part that, well, it's, it's uh, theft, but theft isn't always on balance wrong uh, and lose interest in the first part. After all, if um, we're not for perhaps prepared to let indigent people starve to death, if the only way to prevent that outcome is through tax safe, taxpayer funded social programs, you might think, what does it matter if we say it's theft, but then theft is justified in extreme mm -hmm. circumstances rather than a clean, simple, it's not theft. That might sound like a distinction without a difference, but I think as uh, Michael kind of hinted at in his opening statement or spelled out a little bit, uh, it actually does make a giant difference. Uh, it certainly makes a giant difference uh, when you start to think about things like whether it would be uh, morally justifiable uh, to have the sorts of things that Bernie Sanders was talking about during his two runs for president, uh, like Medicare for all or universal tuition free uh, higher education, uh, which would, as uh, his centrist opponents point out in those races, involve uh, raising taxes uh, even on middle class people uh, and, uh, and would benefit not just people who are desperately in need of those things, people who wouldn't have health insurance or couldn't go to college uh, if, uh, if those things were treated as commodities, uh, but, uh, but even people who might you know, be able to afford them just fine if they were treated as commodities because the democratic socialist position is that things like healthcare and higher education are important human rights that, uh, that everybody should have, whether they could pay for them if they're treated as commodity or not, and that treating them as a commodity uh, is morally indefensible. Uh, and so that is going to be a basic distinction and, uh, and I think the charity monger thing actually brings out the point quite nicely because of course, for example, Medicare for all would actually be a financial boon to middle income taxpayers since the current combined cost of taxes and private health insurance premiums uh, is much more than the future tax burden would be for those for middle income tax uh, taxpayers uh, if we had Medicare for all. Uh, but of course, if you think that it's wrong, it's theft and all that, then that would just be like the charity mugger. Um, and I think if we take a broader view and think about what would be ruled out by saying that, uh, that it's wrong and it has a wrongness similar to theft, uh, you know, maybe taxing Peter to pay for Paul's health insurance is like stealing a loaf of bread from Peter to pay, pay Paul, although honestly, even that sounds a little dubious, but uh, even if it is like that, it's certainly only like that if Peter would otherwise not have uh, health insurance. Um, and... Um, on a more mundane level, think about public libraries. I think those are vital public institutions and privatizing them would be deeply unjust. But if we see taxation in the same light as street level theft, the justification for public libraries comes under severe threat. Uh, you know, Michael Humer might grant you that mugging an innocent person would be defensible if this was the only way to feed your starving family. But I seriously doubt he'd give you a pass for mugging an innocent to pay for books for your family because they'd already read all the books in the house. So why do I think it's circular to say that taxation is uh, wrong or even all else being equal wrong because it's theft. Uh, the reason is that part of what it means to say that something is theft is that it's wrong. And this is worth digging into. This is a crucial point, even though it might sound nitpicky. Because uh, theft doesn't and can't just mean the definition that we just heard. It can't mean just taking something that's currently in someone else's per possession without their permission. Because if it was just taking something that's currently in someone else's possession without their uh, permission, then recovering stolen property would be theft, so that can't be right. Uh, it can't even, uh, as uh, as Michael indicated, you know, with the Hermit Spear example, it can't even be uh, that uh, that it's that theft is uh, taking uh, something that's currently in someone else's permission uh, possession without their permission when they have a legal right to it. And in fact, it really can't be that if you're going to say that taxation is theft, uh, because. Of course, uh, if, uh, if taxation is legally established, then the portion of your income you owe in taxes legally belongs to the IRS, not to you. 
So that doesn't work either. So it can't just be taking something that's currently in someone else's possession without their permission. It can't even be that plus a legal right to it. It has to be that you're taking something from someone else that's, that's, that's currently in someone else's possession without their permission when they have a moral right to it. And not even just a like mild default, like all else being equal, uh, the the fact that something's currently in someone's possession gives us is like a reason for it to stay in their possession, but a really, really strong moral, right? Maybe one that could be overridden by someone stealing a loaf of bread to feed their starving family, but certainly not one that can be overridden for all the other social purposes uh, that I've just mentioned. And so I would say that all of uh, Dr. Humer's work is still ahead of him because he hasn't given us any reason to think that uh, they that uh, the people, for example, who are paying payroll, payroll taxes uh, to uh, pay for uh, old age insurance, you know, social security, uh, that those that those workers have a moral right to their possessions in ways that the uh, you know that overrides the moral right of the retirees uh, to uh, to get social insurance. Uh, and if we can't say on pain of circularity that we have a strong moral right to the portion of our income being taxed because taxing it would be like theft. We must have that strong moral right because of some substantive libertarian moral theory of uh, property rights. I have yet to hear such a theory. Maybe one will be provided in the rebuttal. Meanwhile, though, I want to end on this point. Our moral horror at mugging or home invasion robbery is not reduced one iota if the victim is a public school teacher or a firefighter or an artist living off a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts and the mugger is a private sector taxpayer. But why not? If some substantive libertarian theory of property rights is correct, that then that private sector taxpayer uh, robbing that public school teacher would be recovering stolen property. So it seems to me that the libertarian can't have it both ways. Either they can trade on our moral horror at home invasions and back alley muggings to convince us that taxation is wrong, or they can ground the wrongness of taxation in a substantive libertarian theory of property rights. But I do think they have to pick. Thank you very much. Did you have anything else? Sorry, didn't me interrupt. You got it. And so thanks very much. We are going to jump into the rebuttal sections now, folks. These are each going to be 10 minutes from each speaker. And then we'll have, following that, about 30 minutes of open dialogue and then 30 minutes or so of Q&A at the end. But do want to let you know right now, folks, our guests are linked in the description. And so we highly encourage you to check out their links. And that includes if you're listening to Modern Day Debate via podcast, as all of our debates are uploaded via podcast format as well. And you can find our guest links in the description description box for each podcast episode. So thanks for that. And with that, Dr. Michael Humer, the floor is all yours for that 10 minute rebuttal. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so I don't know, I was just going to comment on a few things on um, how to define that. Um, I said it was a transfer, a uh, non voluntary transfer of property, something like that. Um, I think Ben's view is, well, it sounded like maybe his view was, oh, it's wrongful transfer of property, um, or maybe the view is just like the term prop like property already contains a moral uh, implication, right? Like saying that it's your property means that you have a right to it or something. Um, now, I don't think theft is defined to be wrongful because, you know, you can have a theft that's justified. Um, but, you know, it might be it might be that the notion of property is normative, like something that you have right, certain kinds of rights over. So uh, I guess that sounds okay, but I don't think that that makes much of a problem because like, I think um, I'm pretty confident of, you know, my belief in property. And, uh, and I don't think that I have to prove that there are property rights. So I guess, let me just go to the, you know, that, that's the second thing I wanna talk about. Like, um, yeah, yeah, why does anybody have property rights? So now it happens that I have basically a locking view of property, right? That, okay, so I think if there's, you know, stuff in the state of nature and whatever, nobody's using it, then you can go and mix your labor with it and then you can acquire it and you can transfer the property by, uh, by mutual consent. Um, and, you know, I haven't, I don't have exactly a worked out theory of why there are property rights at all, but I don't, I don't really think that I have to give this like a complete theory about that or I don't know. I don't, I think I have to give much of a theory at all. Uh, and partly because I think it's extremely widely accepted 
And so I think it's kind of like a default assumption unless somebody can show why there shouldn't be any property. Um, I don't think that there's like really a viable alternative um, system, right? So there are valuable goods in the world where there are different uses of them that people want to make that are incompatible with each other. And we need some kind of solution to that. And the solution that we're using is property rights, which is each of these things gets assigned to a particular person who makes the decisions about what how it gets used. Okay. And I, I think, so there are other possible systems. So there could be a system where it's just a complete free for all. You know, anybody just uses anything at any time. But I basically just don't think that there's a viable alternative system that anyone would want that doesn't involve property. Okay. Now there are things like, um, you know, uh, socialism and communism, where people sometimes say that they don't believe in private property, but that's not actually what they mean, right? Because like in the socialist countries, it was not the case that nobody could own anything. It was the case that you could not own a business. It was not the case you couldn't own any property, right? Like you have, you have money and, you know, you, you could own your shirt, you know, whatever, and these other things. Okay. Anyway, so... Um, uh, the other thing I want to say is, so I think that I'm kind of um, using common sense morality when I say, like, I think people have property and like, you know, the money that I earned working at some job or something, that that's my money. Okay. And I think that if you think that that's not my money, then it's hard to explain why a random person can't then just come and take it from me. It's like, okay, if I don't have a property right in that money. Uh, now you might think, um, you know, maybe there's, there's some story about, well, it's actually the government's money, right? Maybe it's the government's money. That's why the random person can't take it, because not because they'd be stealing from me. So, <laughs> they'd be stealing from the government. I guess, you know, you have to imagine that it was the money that I was going to send to the IRS. That's the way okay. All right, but anyway, but I think that if that's your view, I think that we need an explanation of um, why the government is special. Right? So, like, they're just declaring that they get to take a certain amount of money. They're declaring that it's theirs. And I wanna know why it's not okay for just any other person or organization to just declare that some stuff is theirs and then force me to take it. Like what gives those people the authority to say uh, how much money everybody owes them? Uh, and I basically just don't think that there's any good answer to that. Okay, anyway, the last thing that I wanna talk about um, was, oh yeah, the uh, can you take money from, you know, just like you go to some public school teacher and can you just like rob them? <laughs> um, and you know, this doesn't really seem very good. It doesn't seem like you should do that. It doesn't seem permissible. Um, I think that's kind of analogous to, so um, you've identified some thief and like that's the person's occupation. And like, imagine that you follow the thief around. So if you rob the thief, I think that's okay. Right? There's a guy whose occupation, like his sole occupation is thief. You can take his money from him. Okay, but what if you do this? You follow him around, you wait until he goes to some business and he spends the money. So like he goes to the dry cleaner and takes his dry cleaning there. And then, you know, later he comes back, he collects dry cleaning. And, uh, and you know how many items uh, he had dry cleaned, so you know what the bill was. Okay, then later that night, you break into the dry cleaner and you take that amount of money from them. Is that okay? Like, I'm not sure that that's okay. Oh, that, that's a little shady, right? Um, or, you know, you could take it a step further, right? So, you know, you might say, oh, but it's stolen money, so like, I can't even. Um, but, you know, what if we took it a step further? Like, um, okay, and then the dry cleaner spends that money somewhere else. Like, and then you go to the next person, right? And so instead of robbing the dry cleaner, you break into some other business, because the dry cleaner spent some money. And like you do some calculation to figure out what portion of the money this other business had that was stolen. Like, this doesn't seem okay, right? So, I mean, I don't really know. I don't know what the right account is. Like, uh, I think it's definitely okay to take back from the first thief. But if you go to the people that the thief spent the money on, it and, you know, it gets more questionable then. And sort of like, as you go further steps, it gets more questionable. Um, the other thing is, um, I would feel differently if I thought it was like an illegitimate job that shouldn't exist or something. So if you're like, um, 
you know, like if you're talking about taking money from the defense contractor or something. Well, it's not that I think that that's illegitimate, I guess, but I think that it's just too much of it. All right. So, but, you know, let's say it's, you know, one of these companies that's making the bombs for blowing up people in Iraq or whatever. And you think that that shouldn't be happening at all. Then it's fine to take that, right? It's fine to take the money from that. I, I would agree with that. Um, but the thing is, um, you're like school teacher, it's not like a job that shouldn't exist. It just should be funded differently. And if the government wasn't doing the stealing, it's not like they wouldn't, there wouldn't be school teachers or they wouldn't be getting any money, right? I mean, it would have, it would have to be privatized, right? So, I mean, it's not, it doesn't seem like it's exactly fair to say, oh yeah, you just like take all their money, right? Because they were funded by the government, right? By the way, like if you thought that, the government is into so much of the economy, like, oh my God, like, you know, is anybody entitled to any of their money, right? Because it's like, I mean, there's so much influence on everything. Like, if you try to trace, like, what what money would I still have if the government wasn't doing anything? Like, it might be that no particular transaction that happened would have happened, right? So then it's not, I don't know, you know, and then it's not clear that any of us would be entitled to the money, right? So, okay, but anyway, like, I, I just want to say, like, it's a kind of a complicated question. What is the appropriate remedy if you think that taxation is theft? But um, I don't think that changes you know, just, just the judgment that it is a form of theft. Like, I'd like the government to stop doing it, but I'm not sure exactly what the rest of us should do about it if the government refuses to stop. Right? Okay, that's all I have for now. You got to thank you very much for that rebuttal, and we'll kick it over to Dr. Ben Burgess for his 10-minute rebuttal as well. Thanks so much, Ben. The floor is all yours. Yeah, so um, let's, I, I want to make sure that everybody's like clear about the larger dialectical context here. Uh, so Michael Humer said in his opening statement uh, that taxation is wrong because it's like theft, uh, because the thing that makes something theft is that you're taking someone's property. Please flag that because it's a deeply equivocal word to use here, someone's property uh, without, uh, without their consent. Uh, one of the things that I pointed out in response uh, is that, you know, what their property is, right, what we mean by their property is deeply ambiguous. Uh, so one thing it could mean is any, pro any property that currently happens to be in their possession, uh, but that can't be it, or else uh, recover in stolen property uh, you know, without, uh, without the permission of the thief uh, would, uh, would, would be theft, which is certainly not, you know, we heard the claim that this is moral common sense. That's certainly not moral common sense. Uh, another thing that it could mean is, uh, is that uh, it's, you know, theft is, take, is a non-voluntary transfer of someone's legal property, uh, but with the Hermit Spear example, uh, Dr. Humer made it clear that that's, that's not the, the notion that he has in mind. Uh, and in any case, it can't be the notion that he has in mind, because if so, uh, the suggestion that taxation could count as a form of theft would just be incoherent on the face of it, uh, because, of course, uh, you do not have any sort of legal right to, uh, to property uh, that's, uh, that's being taxed. Uh, so that leaves the idea that it's something you have a moral right to. Uh, Dr. Humer said just now uh, that um, that it's uh, that it, that text is that wrongfulness can't be baked into the meaning of theft because theft can sometimes, under extreme circumstances, be justified. But I think that's entirely too quick. Uh, you can uh, you can say that uh, that what it means to uh, to steal something that you know that part of that it means taking away property that someone generally has a moral right to that all else being equal they have a moral right to that they have a uh, that they have a moral right to unless some dire emergency uh, overrides uh, their uh, their normal uh, their normal moral right to it uh, and in all cases uh, it's been built in and some such notion has to be built in. Uh, unless, uh, unless Dr. Humer can give us a fourth alternative to your property means property currently in your possession, your property means property that you have a legal right to, and your property means property that you have a moral right to, even if that moral right is a defeasible moral right. Uh, so it's, uh, and if you even think that we're talking about defeasible moral right, uh, then it's then it seems to me that saying that taxation is wrong because it's theft is still hopelessly circular. That you know it's it's wrong uh, because it's wrong. 
Uh, so that's so that's one question. Can we ground the alleged wrongfulness of taxation uh, in the in its status allegedly as a form of theft? And I don't think we can non-circularly do that. Second question. Well, if, if that's not it, right? Why why is it wrong, right? Like, or to put the question differently, uh, if we are talking about even a defeasible but still very strong moral right. I mean, presumably we're not talking about just like a mild default that can be overridden for the sake of public libraries and public schools and NEA grants and all that stuff, uh, but, a, but a very strong moral right. Uh, where does this very strong moral right come from? Well, I heard at least two different answers there. Uh, one uh, was that Dr. Humer accepts uh, the Lockean theory of property rights uh, or more or less the lock-in theory of property rights. Uh, the other one was that he doesn't actually need to give us theory of property rights because uh, it's extremely widely accepted that property is a thing that should exist. But I think there's, an imp there's a really important slippage at, at the end of that argument. Uh, it's widely accepted that property is something uh, that, that should exist. In other words, that some people should have exclusive rights or near exclusive rights to, uh, to use some you know, objects in the external world. But that is compatible with everything from a lock-in theory of property rights that might actually ground the idea that taxation is theft uh, to a Rawlsian theory of property rights, where you say, sure, you know, you accept a lot of the things that we just heard uh, from Dr. Humer, that of course, you know, you have this problem of different people wanting access to different kinds of scarce resources. Uh, and even as he quite correctly says, socialists who don't think that uh, some people should have exclusive access, you know, access to the means of production, certainly think that we should have exclusive access to, you know, shirts and whiskey bottles and, you know, and, and, uh, and, all, and all of that stuff. But, uh, that's totally compatible with saying that the right view is that uh, is that we should have exclusive that the things that we should have exclusive property rights to or near exclusive property rights to are our after tax income, not our pre tax income. That's a completely separate question from whether property is a thing that should exist in the world, whether there are pieces of property that people have moral rights to, of course, but whether there are, there are things that are, there are external objects in the world that some people should have near exclusive rights to is totally compatible with either saying that the worker who's being taxed to pay for social security benefits for, uh, uh, for, uh, for retirees is the person with the moral right to that dollar and with saying that the uh, that uh, the retiree is the person with the defeasible but very strong you know moral right uh, to that dollar, just saying that property is a thing that should exist takes us no further forward at all in answering the question of which of them has a morally uh, correct claim. Uh, finally, I want to come back to this question of whether, in fact, what uh, Dr. Humor is defending is common sense morality. I think it's not. Uh, I, you know, and uh, and I, I know I went very quickly past the the Rawls and stuff. I didn't. We haven't really gone into what either the Rawlsian or the Lockean theories of property rights actually look like. Maybe we can do that in open discussion or Q and A. But for the sake of of not running out of time, I want to come back to this point about common sense morality. Uh, so. Uh, he says, well, this is common sense morality because the money you earned at some job is your money. Uh, if it's not your money, uh, can a random person come and take it? You know, what's, uh, why is the government special? Well, I'd say that the example about the private sector taxpayer mugging the public school teacher actually shows precisely that this is not even compatible with common sense morality because we heard some very tentative very, you know, halfway kind of things that could be said for, well, it's not exactly great to rob uh, the public school teacher, uh, but common sense morality makes zero distinction between a private sector taxpayer robbing a public school teacher uh, and, a, uh, and, and uh, somebody robbing a private sector employee or business owner. No distinction whatsoever. Uh, so if you are going to make a distinction, it doesn't sound like common sense morality to me. So is this like stealing, uh, would this, on the assumption that taxation is theft, would a private sector taxpayer motivated by libertarian principles uh, stealing uh, from a public school teacher, would that be like stealing from Tony Soprano's dry cleaner? Um, 
Well, no, because uh, presumably, uh, you know, one uh, one difference is that the dry cleaner doesn't have a money that is that doesn't have an income that's entirely derived from theft. Whereas, if taxation is theft, any public employee, by definition, um, has an income that is 100% derived from theft. Uh, and another obvious disanalogy between the uh, the, uh, the dry cleaner uh, and the um, uh, and uh, the public employee is that the public employee knows that 100% of their income came from taxation. Uh, so, uh, so this is like somebody who is presumably, if taxation is theft, is knowingly accepting uh, stolen property. In fact, their entire job is accepted stolen property. They're less like Tony Soprano's dry cleaner than like one of Tony Soprano's employees, uh, you know, who uh, who has a income that's entirely derived from money that they know is laundered uh, from uh, from the uh, from the mafia. Um, so, uh, sure, is it true that the immoral intuition that it, that it's okay to recover stolen property gets weaker the more steps you go? Uh, it is, by the way, I don't think lock, the lock-in theory of property rights can make sense of that intuition. But yeah, it is true that intuitively it gets weaker the more steps we go away. But also in the case of a public employee, we've gone exactly one step. Theft, here's my stolen money. Um, and finally, this idea that the government runs so much of the economy that if people uh, aren't entitled to the money they get from the government, it's not clear that any of us are entitled to anything. Uh, I, I think that uh, I think that that is completely correct, uh, but I think that it cuts against any sort of lock-in property rights derived idea that taxation is theft, because it undercuts the idea that we all have this very strong uh, property right to our pre-tax income that we can make sense of through some sort of lock-in or quasi-lock-in theory of uh, theory of property rights. So I think that too shows that this can't count as a kind of common sense morality. You got it. Thank you very much, Dr. Burgess, as well. Now we're going to jump into the open conversation, folks. And friendly reminder that our guests are linked in the description. So check those out. And want to remind you, as always, folks, to be your regular friendly selves, attacking the arguments and not the person. Thanks so much, as the vast majority of you do a great job of that, and we appreciate it. So anyway, the floor is all yours, Dr. Humer and Dr. Burgess. Thanks so much. Thanks. Um, you know, I feel like I still didn't hear why the government is special. So like if I was doing stuff that looked like what the government is doing, I'd be a thief, right? Mm -hmm. So like, so I don't know why they get to do all this stuff. Yeah. Uh, so I think, I think part of what I said was, was indirectly responsive to it, which is that uh, the person who believes that taxation is theft mm -hmm. has exactly the same problem. Uh, that uh, that it cuts both ways, and it cuts both ways to a precisely equal extent, actually maybe even greater this way, because as you point out, so much income is ultimately derived from the government. In fact, it's not clear that uh, we would, like, if not for this so-called theft, there would be anything to steal, uh, because uh, money gets its value from the fact that it is taxed. Uh, it uh, The money in your pocket and my pocket would not be worth anything if, uh, if taxation uh, didn't exist. Uh, but why is it either, from my perspective, as somebody who believes that the retiree living on Social Security uh, does have a moral right uh, to, uh, to that Social Security income, uh, or from, uh, you know, why is it that from my perspective, it's okay to have taxation as a mechanism uh, for, uh, for doing that transfer? Uh, and why is it that from your perspective, uh, the out of all the things that we can morally legitimately do to rectify this alleged injustice, one of them is not uh, having uh, workers uh, mug retirees to uh, to get back uh, that social security money. And I think that the uh, I think that the equivalence of these suggests to me that the right answer isn't a uh, a deep principled one. Uh, the, uh, the 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 thing is that somebody has to enforce whatever property rights you believe in. Right, whether the whether the scheme of property rights that you believe in uh, is one whereby uh, everybody can sort of keep whatever they happen to be in possession of after market transactions, or whether the scheme of property rights you believe in is that everybody gets to uh, everybody gets to have 
uh, whatever they'll get after a just system of redistribution, someone has to enforce that distribution. And there are massive consequentialist reasons why it's preferable for it to be some sort of uh, orderly, predictable, uh, non-chaotic, uh, you know, non-terrifying uh, mechanism like paying, uh, uh, like having a central government collecting taxes rather than uh, vigilantes in the street using their best judgment. Okay, so I'm getting that. Okay, okay, so the government is special because um, it's really good to have a government, it's to have a government doing this stuff, and it's a lot better than having somebody else doing it. That's what I'm getting. But, um, but then I don't understand why the charity mugging isn't okay. Because, like, if it's just, if, if it's really a consequentialist reason, like, well, I'm producing better consequences. So people, so you know, stipulate that that's the case. Assuming you agree that that's possible, it could be stealing. I could be taking somebody's money in the way that would conventionally be called stealing, <laughs> and then I could spend it in a way that produces more good, right? So, like, I, I mean, if the justification for government is a consequentialist one, then I don't see why the charity mugger doesn't get to use it. Uh, because the uh, the same consequentialist justification can't be offered. Uh, part of the consequentialist justification can be offered uh, that the charity mugger, you know, if they're uh, if they're doing, you know, more the uh, exactly, you know, the uh, the charities that they should morally do uh, that they have that it's going in the uh, that's going that's going to the right place. Uh, but the the consequentialist justification that uh, that I just offered uh, can't be given. To, uh, to the charity mugger, because the consequentialist considerations that I was bringing up, which remember are, um, are separate from what the right distribution of goods is, right? You've got a libertarian theory of what the right distribution of goods is, that the just distribution of goods is that everybody has whatever they can get uh, through a series of market transactions where they respect the rules of the market and maybe the, all the property ultimately goes back to some lucky and just act of original acquisition that, you know, that's one theory. I've got my theory of what counts as a just distribution, which would ultimately uh, be a, a Rawlsian one, uh, that it's, it's one that we would agree to uh, if, uh, if, we, uh, if we were designing a society and we didn't know who we were going to be uh, in, uh, in that society. But whatever you think the right answer to that question is, somebody has to do the enforcement, right? Somebody, in other words, right. has to enforce property claims. And yes. so the distinction between the charity mugger uh, and the uh, and the government playing you know paying for social uh, social programs. I actually think there are other distinctions, but the one that I already pointed to uh, was that having yeah. random muggers just sort of using their own judgment uh, engaged in violence on the street uh, causes a lot of chaos and fear and unpredictability yeah. uh, in ways in ways that having a regular routine uh, democratically legitimate system uh, of, uh, of, of taxation where you know it's baked in when you get paid, you know this part is gonna be withdrawn, or you're gonna owe this part in taxes, just doesn't. Gotcha. Okay, so I understood that. Um, so, I mean, so you sort of restated the argument. So I'm not saying that the same consequentialist reason applies. I'm saying there is a consequentialist reason for the charity mugger. Right, and if you, and right, and so like what you said at the end there was sounded like, oh well, you're going to cause social chaos, but that really doesn't seem likely. So, like, there's a lot of mugging occurring in the country already. There's a lot. There are like millions of crimes every year. So if I go out and mug someone, that's not going to appreciably contribute to social chaos. And then I'm producing a good consequence. I don't see why it has to be exactly the same good consequence the government is producing, right? Yeah, I mean, it seems like a pretty clear distinction to me that you know that we have that uh, that you have one package of good consequences uh, that uh, that doesn't have any you know that uh, that includes uh, the avoidance of uh, of social chaos, fear, etc., uh, and you have another uh, another package of good consequences that includes everything but that uh, that one of them would have a different moral status than the other. That seems pretty straightforward. Um. This does not seem very straightforward to me. Okay, so, um, is it so? Is consequentialism true? No, but uh, but that's but that doesn't mean that consequentialist considerations are morally irrelevant, uh, especially when there isn't any sort of uh, deontological principle that would uh, that would override them that I would accept in this case. Okay, so so maybe this is your argument, like 
Well, there are consequentialist reasons for doing the charity mugging, but there are stronger consequentialist reasons for you know, the government taking the money. And so like, that's why it's okay for the government. Yeah, so I, I think that there are non-consequentialist reasons. There are Rawlsian reasons why we should have a distribution of uh, distribution of goods that's not just whatever comes out of the free market. Those are in principle reasons. Now, the, now we're asking a different question, which is how should that distribution should be should be enforced? Should it be enforced by uh, everybody sort of using their individual judgment in this unpredictable, chaotic way, uh, or should it be enforced through a orderly, predictable system? Uh, and that, you know, consequentialist reason seems uh, seems like a pretty strong and compelling one to me. I mean, so like, here's a view. Okay, there's a consequentialist reason for me to mug the people on the street and, you know, give it to charity. But that reason is just not strong enough to outweigh their property rights. You know, like, maybe there's a prima facie right that could be outweighed by sufficiently strong consequences. Uh, but it's just not strong enough in the case, right? But, I mean... But it is strong enough for the government, right? But that that would be overly convenient, and I mean, I think that the charity mother might actually have a stronger reason because, you know, what if they're an effective altruist and they're giving it to a really good charity, and the government is actually not a really effective cause, right? Like, you know, the vast majority of the money the government is spending is not going to good causes, right? And like a huge amount of it is wasted, so. I mean, it seems like, I don't know, the charity mugger maybe has a stronger reason. Well, I mean, I obviously don't think that the charity mugger has a stronger case. I think that uh, I think that having uh, universal social rights, uh, you know, paid for by, you know, progressive taxation and free at the point of service is unfathomably morally superior to uh, relying on individual effective altruists, that, the, uh, that relying on charity is... Um, uh, is is degrading. It puts you in a position. It makes you much less free because it puts you in a position of powerlessness. Because the person giving you the charity, you know, can uh, can cut it off uh, at any time. Uh, so having uh, it uh, it ties people, you know, to uh, to to their jobs because they uh, they don't want to have to. Uh, you know, they don't want to quit those jobs, you know, because then they'd be, you know, then they would be sort of thrown on the mercy of charity and hoping that people are effective altruists. Uh, so I think that the, I think that the government does have a much better case just to start with than the charity mugger uh, before we even get into the question of uh, the, uh, of the general wrongness of, uh, of inflicting traumatic experiences uh, that, uh, that are going to, uh, uh, that, uh, that, that, you know, they're going to scar people that, you know, having, you know, introducing the sense of chaos into their lives, you know, that you can, you can say that people have a general moral right uh, to a certain kind of uh, order and predictability uh, in, uh, in their lives that is actually very much uh, like the general in principle rights that they have to things like healthcare uh, and education. Uh, and if the, uh, if the money is uh, is left uh, in the uh, in the hands of Jeff Bezos and not taxed away to pay for those other things. It violates the second set of rights. Uh, if we uh, if our system for uh, for doing it is uh, street level vigilantism uh, rather than uh, rather than the orderly predictable processes of a democratic government, uh, that uh, that violates the first right. Right. So I mean, um, part of what's going on is I think. You might be appealing to rural utilitarianism rather than, or sort of like rural consequentialism rather than act consequentialism. And I was thinking in the you know act consequentialist way. In other words, I'm thinking if I go out and mug someone, that's not going to undermine social order. And then I'll take that money and it'll do a lot of good when I give it to the most effective charities. I think maybe you're saying, oh, but if a whole bunch of people, like if we have a general rule that just like everybody does that, then that's going to have bad consequences. Now, is that right? No. Uh, so I think that on an individual level, on a case-by-case -case level, and again, they have, uh, I'm, I'm not a actor to utilitarian, rule utilitarian, or any kind of utilitarian, uh, but like almost everybody, at least if they're being honest, I do think that uh, when there's no principled reason uh, to do something or not to do something, consequentialist reasons do have their place. Yeah. Uh, and I think that, uh, and I think that when it comes to this particular consequentialist reason, I absolutely think uh, that it applies on a case by case level. I mean, anybody who's ever been robbed, uh, whether you know at knife point, you know, by uh, by a mugger, uh, or even by like a home invader, 
who, uh, who came in without waking them up uh, knows that it's a terrifying experience that introduces a sense of chaos into your life, makes you feel powerless, uh, has all sorts of bad consequences. Uh, and I believe that those, uh, that those bad consequences and that, that general sense <laughs> that people have a right uh, to, uh, to security, to predictability, to know, uh, you know whether they're going to be able to have some, you know, some possession uh, in the future, that, that, that those are precisely the considerations and certainly not anything remotely resembling Lockean property rights ideology uh, that drive our normal common sense moral horror at muggins and home invasions. Okay. Okay. So you appeal to like, oh, so you might be a person on the street and then they feel fear in that moment. I mean, I think on, I mean, for one thing, I think, yeah, but that fear is going to be so vastly outweighed by the amount of good that money could do. I mean, you know, assuming that I mug a rich person, right? <laughs> you get enough money to save somebody's life. Or something. I mean, fear seems kind of, I don't know, it's, you know, temporary. Specific. But anyway, but the other thing is, oh, okay, so let me just, you know, it's like modify it. I should steal the money in a way that won't cause that fear of physical injury, right? So I, uh, maybe I should hack into people's bank accounts and like take the money out that way, right? And then, and then you said, oh, but there's this unpredictability. So like people won't be able to plan because they won't know when their bank account is going to be hacked into. Like, okay, so like what if I just do it regularly, right? So like they always know that they're, they're going to get hacked into and yeah, I'm going to take the money, right? At a particular time particularly writing. And I guess, I, I mean, I think most people's reaction would be, well, no, you still can't do that, right? Yeah, so I think that, uh, I think that what you're, I mean, first of all, uh, you're not going to uh, to have that uh, that kind of, uh, of, of predictability and orderliness uh, in, uh, you know, in, in theft. Um, and uh, and uh, you know you could say well if you did uh, then it would be somewhat less uh, objectionable and that's certainly true and if we removed more and more and more of the disanalogies between ordinary street level theft uh, and um, uh, and uh, government taxation such that for example uh, the money in your pocket would have no value uh, if not for the activity of uh, of muggers then uh, mugging would start to seem less and less and less objectionable. Uh, but that, to me, doesn't really say anything interesting about the actual moral status of mugging. And I also do want to just step back a little bit to the big picture and note that, you know, since we both you know, have established that we both have exactly the same problem, because on the one hand, if I believe uh, that a uh, that a retiree uh, has a uh, has a right uh, to that uh, that social security income. Uh, that they uh, that they that they should have uh, they should have it and it would be uh, and it would be morally wrong uh, for it to uh, to be kept uh, in the uh, in the hands of the person who has been taxed to uh, to pay for it uh, that it would be a uh, that um, that that would uh, that that would violate their rights but yet I don't think I mean maybe you could convince me for Bezos but you know I don't think that you know that when it comes to a middle income person. Uh, it would be morally right uh, to uh, to mug them. Well, you've got the exactly parallel problem about the public school teacher and the firefighter, uh, or the artist living off of a national endowment uh, for uh, for the arts grant. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, that in our answers, I've given uh, what strike me at least uh, as uh, some pretty clear disanalogies uh, between mugging and taxation, uh, whereas. All you've really said about why it's wrong uh, to uh, to take away uh, the uh, to uh, to to for the private sector taxpayer uh, to mug uh, the uh, the school teacher or firefighter is that well there should be school teachers or firefighters which I'm not sure how relevant that is I mean if if somebody if if a thief uh, gives money to someone uh, and they say hey just so you know this is stolen property but I want you use it, you to use it to start a school, uh, and then you uh, you catch up to them six uh, that that person six blocks later and say sorry that's mine and you have to give it back and you non consensually uh, take it uh, take it back from them presumably we would all be fine with that even though uh, starting a school is a social function that we think should exist uh, so that doesn't really seem uh, like a disanalogy we got that the intuition gets weaker the more steps of the economy we go through, but that's not really a disanalogy because in this case, it's it's gone through exactly one step, right? Thief to person knowingly receiving uh, stolen property. 
uh, and uh, and we've got well if the floodgates would really be opened if we allowed for that, uh, which seems to heighten your problem, not reduce it, at least from my perspective. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, like I think so. The main point that I wanted to make was kind of about you know I don't know why the government is special, and I kind of feel like that wasn't exactly answered. So I think that your I think your view depends upon the idea that um, the people the government is giving the money to are actually owed that money, like um, the people who are getting the social security. Okay, but the thing is, like, I think, I think to justify taxation, I think you need to claim that you actually owe the government the precise amount that the IRS says. I don't see how there's, like, there's no way that's gonna come out of a theory of justice, right? Like. I mean, so, you know, like maybe if we were in an ideal world, like you are, if we we're in a world where there's like the role government that's actually doing what they're supposed to do, right? But I don't see how that's going to come out for like, you know, anyone in the real world that you actually owe the, the actual amount that the government says, right? And like, and, and, you know, when I said that a lot of the stuff they're doing is unjustified, I didn't just mean social welfare programs. I mean, I think there's a bunch of stuff that you would think is unjust. Right? Like I think there's I don't I haven't looked up the military budget lately, okay, but you know when I did, it was the largest in the world by like factor six. It was like six times larger than the in the United States, six times larger than the number two military center or something like that. Right. So I would assume that you would think that most of that's unjustified, right? And there's just like a ton of this other stuff, right? And there's like, okay, they're you know giving big subsidies to big corporations or whatever. And okay. So then and then there's a bunch of stuff that we would disagree about whether it's Justified, right? But then I kind of think like, you know, there's, a, there's no way that they're justifying taking this money unless you think that they have this kind of special authority where like they have the right to just decide what everybody has to do, right? And then, and you know, and even if they're wrong, right? Yeah, so I think I think there are a couple uh, different things uh, going on there. Uh, by the way, James, just so I have a sense, how many, uh, how, how long do we have left here? I want to make sure I'm not. Um... In terms of the intervals or in terms of the 30 minute section? Well, in terms of the intervals, we <laughs> just started, but in terms of the 30 minute section. Three. Huh? I think we're at 20 out of 30. Yeah. Okay, cool. Great. Great, got plenty of time. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so I think that there are two things going on there. Uh, one, uh, is even if uh, some taxation, you know, it's justified to pay uh, taxation to pay for healthcare and education uh, is justified, you know, taxation uh, for uh, to uh, to pay, uh, you know, to pay for the Pentagon uh, could uh, you know could still be unjustified, uh, which I completely agree with, of course, uh, but I'm not sure about the relevance because because uh, if, if the issue is whether any sort of taxation. Uh, is uh, is justified? Say well, not all taxation that currently exists is justified. Yeah, fair enough. You know, some of it is, some of it isn't. Uh, you know, the uh, you know it's a necessary condition for something uh, to be a justified taxation that it's a uh, it's a just use of it. It's uh, it's certainly. Uh, you know, I think that uh, I think that thinking about the charity mugger, you know, it's it's not uh, a uh, it's not a sufficient condition. Uh, the uh, uh, you know, I, I would argue uh, that the that there is uh, that uh, that there is something uh, special about government in the sense uh, that it is morally preferable to have the system uh, for those transfers uh, be uh, the system for enforcing whichever property rights you believe in, right? Uh, be uh, the uh, be having a uh, orderly, uh, predictable. Uh, system, preferably uh, one uh, that we all have democratic input into, uh, rather than having it be something much more haphazard uh, and uh, and chaotic. I would say the same thing, by the way, uh, for uh, for recovering uh, stolen uh, uh, stolen property. That I, I want to live in a world where the system for uh, the system for recovering stolen property, if it's not just a matter of like grabbing the mugger's shoulder and you know yanking the uh, yanking it back, uh, is uh, is one. Where uh, where you have um, lawful you know government functions you know for uh, for doing that uh, rather than that like okay here's the compound where they're keeping it let's get together a private militia uh, and uh, and storm it I think it's generally good 
uh, to have uh, to have that be done by uh, by government rather than uh, rather than done by uh, by vigilantes. Um, and by the way, in the case that you're saying, yeah, okay, but you'd have this overwhelming consequentialist reason to do the charity mugger, you know, when you're saving somebody's life, I think by your own account, uh, you're going to say that the charity mugger is justified there too, or at least that's what you strongly suggested at the end of your statement. Uh, finally, I just wanted to say on this question about uh, the, um, uh, like, okay, is the amount that's being taxed precisely the amount that's being taxed, that should be taxed and all of that. Uh, I, I also think this is a case where you're gonna have a parallel problem because uh, if you're gonna say, well, I have some Lockean theory of property rights uh, that you have a right uh, to, uh, to whatever you have, as long as you can trace it back through some series of free market interactions to a just act of original acquisition where you're mixing your labor with the world or something like that, uh, then of course, Look, the economic history of the real world bears almost no resemblance uh, to, uh, to, to that story. You're absolutely, nobody is gonna be able to trace 100% of their income or anything close to it uh, back, uh, back to a, a pristine uh, Lockean story like that. Uh, but if, if you think that, uh, if you think that, pro that, uh, that rights to current property can be justified by having some vague resemblance or there's enough of a resemblance to that kind of Lockean justification. I don't see the disanalogy between that and saying uh, that taxation you know, can be justified even if the precise amount being, uh, being taxed isn't exactly uh, you know, what it should have on the basis of some well thought out moral theory. Okay, so, um, okay, so a few things. So I agree that it's better to have an orderly system than to have a disorderly system other things being equal. Um, yeah, you know, my actual view is I'm an anarcho-capitalist. We're not going to be able to, you know, like get into that, right? Like, I mean, I'm not, not going to be able to convince you of that, okay? But I'm just going to say, like, like in my view, there is a way of doing it in an orderly way, but without, um, you know, without the taxation, right? Um, and, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't enforce um, property rights without having a central authority or story claim. Um, my point about, you know, when I was saying, oh, you know, some of the tax stuff, some of the taxation is, even you would agree is unjustified, <laughs> like including the, on the Pentagon. Well, I mean, I was thinking it's not just a little bit. I was thinking like on, on a reasonable view, even a reasonable leftist view, it's going to turn out that most of what the government is doing is, is not really justified, right? So, um, so like the Pentagon, know, that's not a small part of the budget. And then there's like interest on the national debt is another big part. Now you might think, oh, but like there's all these social welfare programs that are pretty big that you like. But I actually think that if you believe in that, like they shouldn't even be doing what they're doing. They sh if you believe in social welfare programs, they should be sending it all to the third world. And like, so I think, you know, I think even that they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're definitely not, you know, maximizing the welfare of the least advantage or whatever. Um, all right, so anyway, so, I mean, you know, you could have a debate about like, okay, what's the outcome if we agree that some taxation is unjustified and some is justified. Like, you know, does that does that mean the generic statement taxation is theft is right or not? I don't know. Um, uh, but like, I, mean, I think it's I think it's the majority. Um, anyway, um, oh yeah. Uh, what about so? Would I say that charity mugging is justified? Uh, generally not. Um, so I do believe in so like when you see the child drowning in the pond, I believe you have to pull the child up. Also, I guess, I think if there's a third party who is standing by the pond and some, for some reason you can't pull the child out of the pond, the drowning child, whatever, but you can force another person to pull the child out of the pond, you should force them, right? I guess that's right. Okay, but, um, uh, but you know, it doesn't seem to me like you can uh, just like steal, steal people's money in order to give it to a charity organization in general, like, you know, to deal with this just chronic ongoing problem of poverty. Uh, now, I did discuss that in my book in the problem of political authority at greater length. Um, and I don't, like, in, in, as in many cases, it's not obvious what exactly is the difference between different cases. So, like, you can make some suggestions, but it, like, it's not obvious what is driving our intuitions, but I tend to go with my, you know, go with the intuitions anyway. Um, if you're going to draw an analogy, like, you know, so taxing people in order to give it to the poor, is that more similar to stealing money from 
like, like me stealing money from people in order to give it to a charity organization, or is it more similar to me forcing someone to pull the title out of a pond? It looks like it's more similar to the first case, right? Um, so, you know, so it is like, you know, I've got this ongoing program of coercion. It's, it's to address our chronic social problem, which is not going to be solved, but it's only going to be slightly ameliorated. Um, and, you know, the, the child in the pond, it's like it's a, only an acute emergency. I'm going to do this one time and it's going to be over. Uh, you know, other related question is, by the way, what if the guy, you're trying to for, you know, you want to force the guy to pull the child out of the pond. What if he doesn't do it? Can you then shoot him? So, like, I think the answer to that is no, right? Okay, can you then, like, not shoot him, but do something, like, super unpleasant to him? I think, uh, probably not, right? So, I think you can threaten to do something super unpleasant. But if he calls your bluff, you probably can't actually do it, right? Like, you can point the gun at the guy and say, save that child. But if he refuses, you can't then shoot him, right? That uh, is what I think. Um, okay. There were enough different things that came up that I think I've forgotten some of them, so I'm not sure I've addressed everything they wanted to say. Okay, well, just 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 real quickly, I think the one thing that came up uh, that that I haven't really heard a response to uh, is that it's is that it seemed to me that I was arguing that uh, none of uh, the um, the analogies that you were drawing to uh, to explain why it is uh, that on your view that taxation is theft. Uh, you know, robbing a public school teacher uh, or uh, or a firefighter uh, wouldn't count as uh, as recovering uh, as recovering stolen property. Uh, that you know, I, I kind of went through a list of objections to the things that you said uh, you said would be differences between the cases, and I don't think we've really gotten a response to any of those. Okay, so I might have forgotten. Um... Give you a chance to respond to those, and then we're pretty much at the end of the uh, open dialogue. So I'll give you a chance to respond to the questions, but just want to let you know. I mean, I, mean, I remember uh, when, you know one of the things you said is, "Well, it's only one step." Yeah, I mean, it wasn't really that clear to me. Um, you know, like that that you can rob Tony Soprano's um, dry cleaner. Another thing you said was, "Oh, but you know, he's not the dry cleaner isn't getting a hundred percent of their income from criminals." Yeah, but like. That's why I said you're only taking the amount that Tony Soprano gave them, right? And, well, but they, but right, and my thought was like that, it seems kind of unfair because like, <laughs> you know, like you can take the money before Tony Soprano gives it to them, but like if you take it afterwards, then you, you know, like they were forced to provide the service. Like they provide a service and then, you know, and then they didn't get the money, right? Because he stole it from them, right? So I thought, you know, Right, but I'm not really sure exactly why, but it seems a little shady. So if I uh, so if I give uh, if I steal your TV, and uh, I give it to uh, I give it to James in exchange for some sort of service that he provides to me, uh, you know I um, I say uh, James, if if you make me a real nice cup of coffee, I'll give you uh, I'll give you Michael's TV, uh, and I do. He knows that it's a stolen TV in this analogy. Uh, he is perfectly aware of that. I give him, uh, I give him the TV, and uh, you come around the next day. Uh, you would or you wouldn't have a right to take it back. Yeah, no, I can take the TV, okay, but I don't think that I can just like take money out of the cash register. Right. So, like, yes. I mean, one thing is like I can't say that that specific money, like, I don't know, that specific money, but. Um, I mean, the case so, you know, like, of public public school teacher, you do know that that specific money is derived from taxation because a hundred percent of their money is, and they knew it when they took it. Well, uh, I mean, I was partly thinking, you know, if it, if it weren't for the, you know, incorrect government laws, they would be funded. Like there would be school teachers. And so that person very likely would still be working as a school teacher and they'd be getting paid by, you know, the parents. So like, I was kind of thinking like, well, some of it's legitimate, right? Because like some of it, you know, is actually coming from the people who are benefiting from it, and like they actually want it. Right, but I'm I'm not really sure about that. Although that's also not a disanalogy to the charity mugger, you know, that the who's doing things that genuinely benefit uh, the uh, the people that uh, the people that he's stealing from, um, and and of course, you know, you could have look. I mean, somebody's private schools already <laughs> exist. You know, this is a person who, if you think taxation is theft. 
uh, they they made a conscious decision not to go to work uh, for a uh, for a private school. They made a conscious decision uh, to uh, to go to work uh, for a uh, for an organization I mean, that is by your lights. Uh, I don't think they entirely funded by theft. I mean, I think that sort of like the government has distorted the market um, in a way that sort of makes those decisions. It's not completely their fault, right? It's like they haven't exactly made it illegal. Like they, ha they haven't made it illegal to work for a private school, but they did it a lot harder, right? And they've done it by coercive means. So like I'm, I'm not so much blaming the school teachers for working through public school, right? And I better not because I work for a state school. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think you have a explaining why people can't steal from you. <laughs> maybe I'm biased because I work at the University of Colorado or whatever. But, um, you know, part, like part of my uh, part of my rationalization <laughs> is, well, there would still be universities in the in the just libertarian society, and it's just like the government has done this coercive stuff that makes it just a lot harder. For a private university, you know, to compete. I don't think that people should mug you, but then again, I don't think taxation is theft, so I don't think that uh, I don't think that taking your wallet would be recovering stolen property. Uh, I'm yeah. not sure that on on, well, on I mean, view, it makes sense to say that it's not. I mean, I think like even on your view, I don't think that I don't think you would say that if somebody is stolen from you, that you personally should go over there and forcibly take it back, right? No, but that's that's because I think that there's a uh, there's a distinction in principle between vigilantism uh, and government action, but but the denial of the moral importance of that distinction is actually central to your argument. Well, no, I mean taxation could be theft, but you could still make that distinction, right? Like you could you could say it's theft, but still not agree with vigilantism, right? No, but you know, but the the point is that like the your starting point, right? The, your original argument. Is that there is no difference in principle uh, between uh, street level theft and uh, government taxation? It's not special because the government does it. And if that distinction is not an, is not a morally important one, then I have a hard time seeing why I say, well, no, you can't use vigilantism to get back the money. That would be bad in ways that some other remedies, uh, you know, would be. Whereas from my perspective, since I do think that there's a morally important distinction. Uh, between uh, government taxation and uh, and uh, you know, that, that it actually does more, it is morally significant whether the government is doing it or not. No, but uh, I don't I mean, have that. We'll give you a quick problem. chance to respond, uh, Dr. Humor, and then we got to jump into the Q and A for sure. As we're a few I mean, minutes. I'm not over. exactly. So I'm not exactly getting how this is a good argument from your point of view. It seems like you think that you can't do vigilante activity, even if someone did steal from you. And so then the fact that you can't do the vigilante activity against the government employees, that doesn't show that the money wasn't stolen. Because if it was, you would still say that you can't do it, right? Well, I think that the uh, that the way that you should get stolen money back uh, is through the state, because I think the state action is preferable to, uh, to vigilante ac action. But my question is, from your point of view, given that you think that the public employee is knowingly accepting uh, stolen property and that the private sector uh, taxpayer uh, mugging them uh, can be absolutely certain that every dollar that they're mugging uh, is derived uh, from uh, from theft and they were one of the people who were stolen from. Uh, I think that I, I, I don't still don't really see how you're getting around saying that this is a justified act of recovering stolen property, which in turn, I think, undermines the claim that this is just common sense morality. <laughs> If you have right, a, so we a, both don't see how the other one's view, <laughs> uh, you know, how the argument, yeah, okay. We're both trying to evaluate the argument from the other one's point of view. So, you okay, right. you yeah. got it. Do you feel good on that? I don't want to uh, rush oh, you. So we're supposed to go to a Q&A from uh, viewers or something? That's right. And so thank you very much, gentlemen. This has been so much. There's tons of positive feedback. People are really enjoying this. So thank you. I want to remind you, folks, our guests are linked in the description. So what are you waiting for? You can hear and read more from those links of our guests in the description box below. We're going to jump into this first question from SOD. Thanks for your question. Said you cannot confer. I think this is for you, Ben. They said you cannot confer a right that you don't have to someone else, individually or collectively. No individual has the right to take something that they do not own. We'll give you a chance to respond to that comment. Yeah, no one has no one has a right to take something that they don't own. 
is ambiguous. Again, does own mean is currently in possession of? In that case, nobody believes that no one ever has a right to take something that they, someone else is currently in possession of or recover in stolen property would be wrong. Does it mean uh, that you know nobody has a right to take something that uh, that legally uh, someone else is the possessor of? Well, I don't think a libertarian can say that, uh, you know, for reasons that I've argued uh, earlier. Uh, so. We're, what we're left with is interpretations of that statement that no one has a right to say, so take something they don't own, is no one has a right to take something that someone else has a superior moral right to, which has the virtue of being true, but it's also completely vacuous because it's circular. Gotcha. And this one comes in from SOD again, says, accepting Ben's premise that the IRS owns the money still doesn't allow the IRS to use that money for anything without your consent, which would be akin to a board member using corporate funds without board approval, which is theft. Uh, that seems kind of confused because I, it's, it sounds to me like the questioner wants to have it both ways. Uh, either that they're, on the one hand, they want to grant me for the sake of argument, uh, my assumption that, for example, uh, retirees living off Social Security do have a right to that Social Security income, uh, that and so it's legitimate, therefore, for the state to act on their behalf and deliver it to them. And on the other hand, uh, it sounds like they want to uh, they, they they want to still insist that somehow in that scenario, uh, the person who is taxed to pay for it has a moral right to it. But that's exactly the issue and dispute. Gotcha. And the legend Rivs says, coming after you, Doctor Burgess says, is discriminating against rich people through taxation right? Why should my money get wasted? on the national healthcare fraud of September 30th, 2020? Good question. Wait. <laughs> okay, I think there's like a, some sort of reference there that I'm not, I'm not following. Uh, maybe, um, uh, maybe, maybe somebody can clarify to me what, the, uh, what that September 30th business is about. Uh, but, uh, but I think that, um, but I think if, if the question, if I'm correctly understanding, uh, that uh, that what they're asking about uh, is uh, is why is it right uh, to uh, to pay uh, for uh, for for somebody for um, universal health care program? You know why why would that be morally right? If that's the question, uh, then I'd well, say that just a just a quick add. The first part they said it, is discriminating against the rich people <clears throat> through taxation rights. So I think they mean in terms of. Uh, the varying levels of who is taxed uh, what, and then they had asked, why should my money get wasted on the national health care fraud? Oh, yeah, sure. So let's take the first part first, uh, that, they, uh, that yes, it is right that people who have more money are taxed at a higher level than people who have less money, uh, that uh, I, I, I actually have a really hard time imagining anybody who thought that taxation was justified uh, not believing that further premise. I know that there are people who have that combination of views that taxation isn't theft, but we should have a flat tax, uh, but I don't really understand how that works. Uh, it seems to me uh, that if you think that it is generally justifiable uh, to have uh, to have social programs that are free at the point of service, that are funded by taxation, uh, then that it, would, uh, that it would be much more just uh, to, uh, to tax people with more money at higher levels uh, because uh, they'll, they'll still be left with more because the, because uh, because uh, they're going to take less of a hit in terms of their own lifestyle due to diminishing marginal utility, uh, that you know all of that, uh, all of that seems uh, totally straightforward to me. Uh, I would also add it's a much spicier take, of course, you know, because uh, so far everything I've said in this debate is uh, would you know not neutral ground between me and Michael Humer, of course, but it would be neutral ground between me and like, you know. Um, a much more moderate sort of progressive than I am uh, to, uh, but I also think that uh, that an extra reason why uh, very rich people, it's uh, justifiable to tax at a higher rate uh, is that, uh, uh, is that they, uh, they, they got that money uh, from, uh, from workers who are creating labor, uh, which, uh, you know, which are creating value in ways that they would not have agreed to if not for wildly unequal bargaining positions. And that that and that that is an extra an extra just but, 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 but real quickly on the second half of the question, right? Why is it right that that it's justifiable to uh, to take his money to pay for uh, for national health care? Because uh, if he uh, was behind the veil of ignorance, he knew he had to just to design a society. He knew he'd have to live in it, and he didn't know uh, whether he was uh, you know, what his position would be in that society. He would absolutely opt to have a taxpayer free, funded, free at the point of service. 
a system of national health care because uh, the outcomes are vastly better than uh, than private health care. Look at the World Health Organization rankings uh, because many fewer people would avoidably die because it makes us it gives us much more gotcha. freedom. We must. I hate to jobs, rush you, but etc. Next up, this one from SOD says fencing is a criminal activity as well. Selling the use of one person's tax revenue for votes from another person doesn't make it moral. I feel hey, bad for Michael. Are there any questions yeah. for me? I know. I'm just left out here. Yeah, <laughs> I, I agree with you. Let me just double check to see if there are any that. Oh, we do have one. Uh, let's see. We have a challenge where we have a. There are a lot of for Ben, but let me jump to this one that has. It's for so both of you. They said, they said, hi, James, for both speakers, comparative to taxes, do you consider profit to be theft, especially considering the growing wealth gap? Go with you first, right. Dr. Michael Humer. No, <laughs> I don't consider profit. Well, wait, I mean, that was a really broad statement. Like, all profit? Would I consider all profit to be theft? No, of course not. I like that. <laughs> then, then you couldn't do anything, right? And you couldn't live, right? So, um, but, okay. So, I mean, I think I have different factual beliefs from, you know, socialists and uh, you know, it's not just that I have different values, I have different factual beliefs. So I think that the reason why um, in the market economy, the reason why rich people are getting rich is mostly that they're providing a lot of value. So, yeah, you know, they have like a million dollar profit. I think basically roughly they provide about a million dollars of value to the rest of society. And that's why they got paid a million dollars. And so and, you know, I don't really see the problem. Um, there's, you know, there's growing inequality. I don't think that's necessarily bad. So it could be bad it depends upon how it came about. I don't think inequality by itself is bad. Um, I do think it's bad if there are people who are unable to meet their basic needs. That's bad. But I don't think it's just inherently bad that people have different amounts. Gotcha. Then Ben, do you have a, a quick pithy response? to the question as well. Otherwise, we'll jump to the next one, which. Uh, yeah, I, I do. I think that profit, if profit um, doesn't just mean the colloquial thing that, you know, you have more money than you started with, but uh, is profit derived from your position as the owner of a business? Uh, I, I do think that there is a general case for saying that that's illegitimate. And so if you want to, uh, if, if you want to talk this way, uh, that it's <laughs> uh, that it's theft uh, for reasons that oddly enough, sort of near uh, what uh, what Michael said about um, uh, about his justification for working at a public university uh, that they uh, that this is that there are various historical injustices that uh, that that change the, uh, the the balance of forces on the ground to give some people vastly more bargaining power over others they can use this structural position of power uh, to extract uh, what they would never be able to get freely uh, and. Uh, I also think inequality is bad for a bunch of other reasons, but since this wasn't even my question, we'll save that for later, maybe. Gotcha. This one, Cameron Roberts, thanks for your question for Dr. Humor. They said, how do you define, quote unquote, voluntary? Is rent voluntary? Is wage labor voluntary? Even if essentials of life are withheld from you, if you don't? Um, basically, yes. So, um, so, I mean, the first part of it is how do I define voluntary? And I mean, in philosophy, you can't really define anything. Like whenever you, whenever you give a definition, there's always counterexamples and so on, okay? So I'm not gonna give a precise definition, but I mean, it does have to do with, you know, your, your making an informed choice and you know, nobody coerced you, like, you know, they didn't threaten to do violence to you or whatever. Now, um, you might say, oh, but you know, you could be coerced if you needed a particular thing and like the other person demanded, okay, so like you need money to live in our society or to live decently and uh, you know so you're con you're coerced to take a job right and I don't really think of that as coercion um, here's an example I'd like to give um, so you go to a doctor and like you know you've been diagnosed with cancer and they um, they offer to do a surgery and you're gonna have to pay some amount of money um, okay so whatever you know maybe there's a copay or whatever so it's gonna be a kind of a lot of money um, and then you got to sign this form and then you get the suit. Okay, now, so, side point, there's a fucked up part where they don't even tell you how much it's going to be until afterwards. Okay, so that's fucked up. They should have to tell you. <laughs> but anyway, okay, but let's say they actually told you the amount before and then you sign. Is that a valid agreement? Now I think yes. 
And, and th I don't think this is an extreme libertarian view of my mind. Like, I think this is the standard orthodox view. That's valid, even though you are going to die if you didn't get the surgery. And so why? Well, it doesn't count as coercion because the surgeon didn't give you the cancer. So, like, if he said, I'm going to give you cancer unless you sign this form, that's coerced or it's not voluntary. But if you already had it and he just said, I'm going to solve the problem if you sign this, I, I think that counts, right? And so I think that's analogous to when the employer says, you know, okay, you need money. I'm going to give you some money if you do this thing. Sign here. And then you sign there. You got it. Thanks very much. And then this one coming in from SOD for Ben, they say, saying that taxing property precludes taxation being theft because taxing it is legal is essentially saying that anything the government makes legal cannot be a violation of one's rights. Uh, yeah, but of course that's not anything that I said or hinted at or believe. Uh, what, I, uh, what I said uh, was that uh, various people, um, you know, Dr. Humor here and others, uh, have uh, have said that uh, taxation is wrong because you're taking away something that belongs to you. Uh, and I've said that what I said is that that is equivocal. What does it mean for it to belong to you? That's that's very unclear what it means. There are there are three possible interpretations. Maybe there's a fourth, and I'm not just not being imaginative enough. But the three possible interpretations I can make sense of are one, something that's currently in your possession can't be that. Uh, for you know, because then so recovering stolen property would be theft. Uh, another one is uh, that it's um, that it's something that you have a moral right to, even if it's a defeasible moral right. But then that would be circular, as we keep talking about. And in the middle, a possible interpretation I offered on behalf of the libertarian who makes that claim uh, is uh, is that uh, is that it could just mean that like it legally belongs to you, but they can't say that. Because if that's what they were saying, uh, then taxation couldn't uh, be theft. Uh, so that's the context. That's the only context, actually, in which I, I brought up the, uh, you know, that uh, the problem with saying that taxation is theft because it's legal. It's if hypothetically your view, what you meant by property is property that's legally yours, as opposed to property that's morally yours gotcha. or property that you're currently in possession of. I don't think any of those three it. issues work. And of course, I, I don't. To, think just because that, that like, nothing could be nothing could just be because wrong it's legal. Lots of stuff is we have. Right. Is it okay if I comment on that? Because, Go for it. Because there's a, I mean, I wanted to respond to this point about, you know, sort of the circularity, and I forgot to respond during my rebuttal. But so, actually, I don't think that it's circular, even though property does have a normative meaning, or I don't think it's objectionably circular. But so, I mean, imagine a thing where, you know, you ask, hey, why is Bob a bad person? And then I say, well, he's cowardly and he's dishonest and whatever. Okay, and those terms are normative. But it's not the case that it wasn't explanatory, right? Like it was explanatory. So one way of explaining I'm, I'm sorry, why you, something I'm is the case of, is... I think I just missed... Sorry. Yeah, I, so, I, okay, I so Bob... I, sorry, I think Bob is a bad person. You right. know, you ask why, and I say, well, he's cowardly. Okay, mm -hmm. cowardly is a normative term. So does that mean I gave a circular explanation, right? Like, it, you know, it means something like bad in a certain way. And I think, no. So like, I think it can be a good explanation of why something is bad to use, like to use a concept that entails bad, but it can be explanatory because it's bad in a specific way. You see what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I just say that the disanalogy is we can paraphrase uh, cowardly in a, uh, in a way that takes away the normative part and it still functions as an explanation of why you think that Bob is bad. Uh, and I don't see the analogy for uh, taxation is wrong because it's theft. Well, I mean, it, you know, some, so somebody could give a description of when they think somebody owns property. They could give the descriptor properties that that they think lead to property rights, right? I'm a, well, maybe they could. Maybe it's too complicated. But also, maybe it's too complicated to give the descriptive definition of what you have to do to be courageous, right? So. I mean, and I think that's about equally plausible. So it might be that actually you kind of have to use the normative judgment in order to capture all of the behavior patterns that count as cowardly. Um, but, you know, it's, it's still explanatory, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think you're saying, uh, you know, Bob, uh, I think Bob is uh, is a bad person 
uh, because uh, because he's a coward. And then you can do the uh, the further thing and explain what makes Bob a coward without invoking the fact that in some more general sense, he's a bad person. Whereas the disanalogy I'd say is if you say taxation is wrong because it's theft, uh, well, the question of whether it's theft hinges on whether it's wrong in a way that whether Bob is a coward doesn't hinge on whether he's a bad person. I mean, I mean, I think it would it would hinge on whether the stuff that he did that I said was cowardly was actually, you know, unvirtuous or right morally bad or something like that, right? Sure, but that's but that that might be normative, but it doesn't take us back to where we started with Bob as a bad person. It doesn't rely on the initial judgment, you know, that Bob is a bad person. Whereas saying that, um, so you have uh, Bob is a Bob is a bad person because he's cowardly, and maybe we introduce some other normative stuff, but that doesn't mean we've gone back to uh, Bob is a bad person in a way that when you say taxation is wrong because it's theft, you've gone right back to it's wrong because part of what it means to be theft, it's not just that it has a normative component that, you know, you're, you know that's fine. It's that, the, uh, it's that that normative component takes us right back to where we started. Yeah, I mean, okay. I mean, I'm not seeing the difference at all. Like, I mean, um, I mean, I think so. I mean, I think cowardly Im implies bad in a, at least bad in a respect. So, I mean, I don't think that's different from, you know, the way that like, you know, property implies how to write to it or something. But, but, but he's, I mean, but I, th I mean, I think we might be spending too much time on this. Okay, he's not a coward. Really quick, really quick, pithy response, Ben, and then we're going to jump to the next one. He's not a coward because he's a bad person. Whereas it's uh, it's it would be theft because you don't have a right to take it, which is why it can't ground it being something you don't have a right to take. This one coming in from Parhesia, thanks for your question. Said, how is tax to fund libraries morally justified when that money could be used to prevent the starvation of children in developing countries instead? Yeah, I mean, uh, so so then then we're having an argument about priorities uh, for, uh, for 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 taxes, and I'm perfectly happy. Uh, to uh, to have uh, to have that argument, but that seems to be a uh, a slightly different thing from uh, is taxation justified? And if we made it further far far enough down our list of priorities that we got here, would a justifiable purpose of it be to fund public libraries? So I, mean, you're doing... way, like, I would I would be way more happy with taxation if it was actually going to um, to feed starving children in the third world. Like then I would have. Then I would have a hard time deciding whether it was okay or not. And be like, yeah, maybe that's okay. This one coming in from SOD says, money does not have to be taxed to have value. Even prisons and school cafeterias have ersatz currencies. Yeah, those, those currencies are not going to have the value the government back currency is going to. This one coming in from Bubble Gum Guns says, Ben, crypto and gold don't need government. Uh, I think that if you think that uh, that there is any conceivable world uh, where crypto uh, would function as a uh, as a as a repository of value uh, that would be uh, that would be anything like as reliable uh, as uh, as government backed currency, where we would have a anything resembling a functioning economy uh, with, uh, with 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 only crypto, uh, then we just have a very deep factual disagreement. Dr. Yeah, Hewer? I love Bitcoin. <laughs> I had, I had, to, I was <laughs> going to ask if you weren't going to say. <laughs> yes, we have a deep factual disagreement. Let's just agree on that. You got <laughs> it. And SOD, thanks to your other question, said the mob providing protection in a racket also regularly takes dues. It still comes with the threat of violence from noncompliance. Regularity and stability do not preclude theft. Yeah, I mean, I don't think, I think it's just factually extremely wrong to say that you can have anything remotely approaching uh, the degree of regularity and predictability uh, with uh, with mob protection rackets uh, that you have uh, with, uh, with with government uh, taxation. Uh, again, and this takes us right back to the factual disagreement we have, uh, for, it to, uh, for it to be analogous, uh, it would have to be the case that if uh, the mob protection racket uh, didn't, uh, didn't exist, uh, it would be impossible to have anything that the mob would want to extort uh, in the uh, in the first place. It would have to be the case that uh, that you know, as you know, the entire time you're planning to open up, you know, this deli 
Uh, it was always part of your plan that the mob would extort it, and you know exactly which mafia family would be extorting it, uh, and that you would have, uh, and that you knew that that mafia family would be extorting it realistically uh, for uh, for the entire time your business was going to be uh, in operation, that you were counting on it. Uh, and that doesn't even get into the range of disanalogies, which, to be fair, we haven't really talked to about what I would see as the extreme moral importance of democratic input. Gotcha. And this one, interesting for Dr. Humor, they said, who and how should determine how the big fees should be in the user fee model that you mentioned in your opening? Oh, how would they determine? I mean, so I mean, as a question about justice, they could determine it however they want. Right? In other words, if you're charging a fee for a service, you have the right to make a fee whatever you want. Now, <laughs> that doesn't mean that you should just do anything, but okay, so what would be the smart thing to do? Um, they would think about how much it was worth. Um, they would try to um, they, they would try to bring in as much money as they could. I guess that's what businesses do. So would it, I guess it would be okay for the government to do that. Um, you know, they might consider. So when they consider how much it's worth to you, maybe they could also consider how much they consider how much you'd be willing to pay. I guess that's the same thing. Right? Um, and uh, so you know, it's it's. Um, it's not unreasonable that they could charge different amounts to different people, right? Like if you got more property, they might say, yeah, we're going to charge you more for protection because you got more stuff to protect or whatever. So it would be okay. Like, so I don't know if this is what the question we're getting at, but I think it would be okay to have, um, you know, different amounts of fees for people with different amounts of money. You bet. And this one, thanks very much for your question. Tugboat2030 says to Dr. Humor, was World War II worth fighting for from taxation, or should we have voluntarily asked for donations? I, I think that they're asking, well, yeah, yeah. and then no, yeah, said, question, how about I the mean, Revolutionary War as well? Um, I mean, in my view, so um, I'm not an absolutist, so I don't think property rights are absolute. So I think it can be overridden if there's an emergency. I think you could make the argument. So if we knew that the Holocaust was going to happen, then... You know, we had a good reason for intervening. I don't think that we actually knew that at the time that we entered the war. So, and it might have been that, like, we weren't just like we weren't justified based on the information we had, but we were justified like based upon what was actually going on. Um, so, I think it could be okay to coerce people in in a way that would normally violate their rights if you're like trying to stop a genocide of like millions of people. You got it. And this one. For you, Dr. Humor, as well, I'm not sure what this acronym or what this means exactly. Uh, let me pull this back up. They had said, in P-O-P-A, chapter, I think it's Problem chapter... political authority. Okay, thank you. <laughs> chapter 7.2, they said, you were undecided about equivalence of isolated theft to save one's own life and expropriation programs for effective life-saving charity. Have you decided now? Not really, right? So, like I made that comment earlier in this um, Q and A that okay, if the government were um, stealing money, so it'd still be stealing. But they were stealing money, and they were giving it to the most effective charities, right? And so, like, you know, they could they could be saving millions of lives every year. Then, I, I think maybe that would be okay. Like, I'm not sure, but I think it's not justified. When they're not doing it, they're not even coming anywhere close. You got it. And this one from John Van Divier. Thank you for your question. Said, you guys, one of you or both of you might be able to identify what their point is and who this is for. They had said, please note robust political economy. The idea that public decisions are generally suspect due to knowledge and moral hazard mm -hmm. considerations. Oh, that's definitely for me. That's a, that's a libertarian. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I think that um, you know I I don't uh, I don't accept the factual premise would be the the uh, the pithiest way to do uh, to say it uh, to be to be just a just a touch less pithy. Uh, I think if we um, uh, I think sort of abstract principles about what we expect according to some predictive model from private decision makers versus you know collective democratic decision makers. 
uh, aren't actually going to take us very far in the real world. Uh, I would point to things that I uh, that I said earlier about, for example, the many, many advantages to human flourishing, uh, saving lives, and uh, meaningful human freedom of having uh, universal health care as an obvious case. By the way, just real quickly, uh, I, I would also be curious, just to follow up on the earlier question, uh, we talked about the, uh, the uh, World War II, but how about the, uh, the Civil War, which was uh, the, uh, the one uh, that uh, it was the first time we had federal income taxes to, uh, to pay for that. Uh, and it, there, there's no knowledge problem there, right? I mean, the Southern states seceded in order to preserve slavery by their own account. Uh, so I, I would be curious about whether that taxation was justified on Dr. Humer's view. Uh, probably not. Okay. Uh, well, but I mean, but not just because if it was only that we're spending money and then we're ending slavery, that would be justified. But it was also like, you know, so many people getting killed, right? And the, and it wasn't that, you know, it's not like, oh, that we would have slavery forever. Because like no country in the world, like slavery is illegal everywhere in the world now. So it would still be illegal today if we hadn't had the Civil War. It just would have taken longer. So was it justified to kill all those people? I mean, I don't know, but probably not. Gotcha. This one's an interesting one. Ben, what are your thoughts on this? Is Ozian, do appreciate your question. They said, I think some taxes are reprehensible, such as on food or shelter or water or heat or cooling and clothing. Do you have any sort of like qualifications or unique feelings for those taxes, Ben? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, so I guess I guess we'd have to dig in a little bit more to know exactly what kind of taxes the, um, you know, the questioner had in mind. Do we mean like sales taxes when you purchase those things uh, or, uh, or, or, or do we mean some other kind of taxes? If we do mean sales taxes to uh, purchase those things, then I can see an argument being raised that if the effect of those sales taxes was to make it you know, harder to, um, you know, to afford those things, that would certainly be a moral objection to that. Uh, in general, I like income taxes way more than sales taxes, uh, precisely because I do want to uh, discriminate against the rich, as a previous questioner uh, put it, by, uh, by charging people higher rates as we go up in the, uh, in the income scale and, and sales taxes are flat taxes, uh, which I think is structurally unfair to lower income people. Gotcha. And this one from Brian, I'm not exactly sure, maybe both of you want to respond. They said, property is a corollary of causality. Somebody chose to take an action and they, in order to survive, must be entitled to the effects of that action. Without a valid definition of property, all we have is luck and conquest. Okay. Well, so, I mean, this gets a, a thing that I think is important about property, which is, um, Okay, in my view, like I was saying, you know, a little earlier in the Q&A, um, the main reason why people in the market economy get money is that they produce an amount of value that's, you know, roughly proportional to the amount of money that they receive. It's not always the case. There could be cases where you're cheating people and whatever. But I think it's sort of like, by and large, roughly how it is. And so because you produce the value, it seems to me like it's kind of fair that you get about that amount of value in return. You got it. Thanks very much. And this one coming in from Michael Lyons says, taking from another without consent is violence. How is taxation any different? I guess this is probably, you felt like you've adequately covered this, Ben, in the earlier parts of the over debate. Over and over and over again. <laughs> yeah. And then this one coming in. Let's... Actually, actually, sorry. Can I, can I just add two sentences to what I said earlier? Because I, I think that the specific invocation of violence is an important thing. Uh, because no libertarian theory of property rights is really about violence. Violence is a red herring. Uh, it's, uh, you know, like, because uh, whether we're violently enforcing property rights that people already have, uh, like, uh, you know, like using threats of violence to uh, drive someone off your property, if you're not prepared to do that, the property claim isn't worth much, or you're using uh, the uh, much milder and much more abstract and indirect and less likely to be carried out threat of violence to enforce redistributive taxation, you're still using violence. So the question isn't violence or nonviolence. The question is, which distribution of resources are we enforcing? Gotcha. I'm curious to hear both your thoughts on this one. This is John, appreciate your question. Said, if forcibly taxing 100% of my income makes me a slave, at what percentage am I no longer a slave? 0%. That was an easy answer. Whew, easy question. 
I, I mean, I, I think the I think that my my answer is the the uh, the antecedent is false. Uh, if uh, if a hundred percent of your income is taxed and uh, that income wasn't generated in some horrendously unjustified way, then you have a legitimate complaint. But that legitimate complaint doesn't add up to enslavement. I think that equating uh, you know equating unjust expropriation of uh, goods with slavery uh, really 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 undersells the many and extreme ways in which slavery is morally wrong, most of which are not captured by that. You got it. And Brian F., thanks for your question. want to let you know, folks, we totally have no more time for any additional questions. We've got just several more, and we'll actually, uh, we want to wrap up and want to ask this question from Brian F., who said, should lazy people be able to force others to provide housing and food for them? Can you both agree some taxes are theft? I can agree with that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I think some some taxes are unjustified. I, I, I think uh, Michael actually uh, like named some purposes for which taxation shouldn't exist because the purposes themselves shouldn't exist earlier, like waging imperialist wars. Uh, I don't think that providing uh, you know food and housing are on that list. I think that uh, I think that it's uh, I think everybody, by virtue of being a human being, has a right to things like healthcare and education and housing. Uh, and uh, and the idea that we should let people, um, you know, that we that we should let people go without those things because, in our judgment, they're lazy has a very, uh, you know, let's 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 put it this way: uh, it it doesn't even begin to tempt my moral intuitions. I'm I'm very tempted, um, but but I mean, let me say it's not. I I don't think of it as a retributive point. It's not like, oh, you know, I think you're bad, so <laughs> um, it's more like. So, you know, when the, when the questioner says, oh, they're lazy, I take it that they mean the person can get the money. If we don't give it to them, they can get it. They could just, like, go find a job and they get enough money to survive. They just don't want to. And I think, no, screw them. Make them go to work. Gotcha. Yeah. This last one from Sphincter of Doom, thanks for your question, says, the WHO, the World Health Organization ranking for healthcare is largely useless when it puts South Korea below the U.S., despite it being the best-performing single-payer system. And happens to be the least publicly funded one. Uh, well, I don't know. I don't know about that. Uh, I think that um, I, I think that the fact that the, the questioner uh, thinks that South Korea is in the wrong spot is uh, gives me very little confidence that they know better than the WHO does. I think if you look at the objective the uh, criteria in terms of things like life expectancy that are factored into the WHO rankings. If you look at things like the actual feelings of the recipients of the healthcare that are factored into those rankings, uh, the idea that eh, this one ranking uh, feels off to me uh, doesn't uh, doesn't give me uh, doesn't give me any reason whatsoever, honestly, uh, to uh, to to think that the questioners sort of intuitive rankings are better than the World Health Organization rankings. Gotcha. And want to say, did you have Dr. Humer? Go ahead if you had something. Uh I was going to say, like, well, I feel similarly. Like, uh, I mean, I don't believe what some random person says about some healthcare system in another country, but uh, but I also like basically don't trust anyone else. But like, I don't trust Ben's judgment about that, and I'm not sure. I don't think I even trust the who. Like, um, but I mean, I don't really know. Like, maybe they're right, but I'm not going to assume that because I just think you know, there's just too much political bias. Whenever people tell me, oh, such and such has a great healthcare system, I just totally discount it. I, 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 I mean, I think that uh, I think there are a lot of the things that the WHO uses to determine that uh, that I've already mentioned that I think uh, should not be uh, uh, be discounted. I think that people uh, people live longer; they're less likely to die of preventable diseases. Their children are less likely uh, to die as uh, as infants. The people who are receiving the health care themselves report yeah. better outcomes. So I I, I don't uh, I I would strongly dispute that this is a big mistake. Yeah, so I'm not saying like. Everything is fucked up, right? But I'm saying like it could be easy to skew the overall results. Like if that like that's a super complicated thing to do, like ranking the overall healthcare system. And there've got to be lots and lots of choices that are kind of subjective. Right? So, got it. And want to I mean, say, here, folks, our guests here's are a, linked. There's a general reason the, to think that they, to, the, to think that I, look I, at I, look at every country I, that's adopted a universal. I do want to just respect your guys' time. I'm I'm even so sorry. Parties have to at least pretend to want to keep it. I do want to. 
we're basically folks i want to encourage you to, to hear more i know folks you're like i i know there's more so i want to encourage you to click on our guest links in the description box. You can hear more, you can read more. <laughs> we really do appreciate our guests, folks. And so really, I, I'm sure you do because you've been listening and I, the feedback has been awesome. So we're so glad you enjoyed it, folks. And please do click on those links in the description box for our guests. And that way you can hear plenty more from them, read plenty more from them. And so thank you very much, Dr. Humor and Dr. Burgess. It's been a true pleasure to have you with us tonight. Thanks, James. All right, thanks. It's been fun. Absolutely. And well, folks, I will be back in just a moment with a post credit scene letting you know about upcoming juicy debates such as the one on the bottom right of your screen. It's going to be a great one. And so stick around. I'll be right back in just a moment. Thanks again to our guests and their links are below in the description box. Folks, that was awesome. I can't say it enough just how much we enjoyed that. We really do appreciate our guests, and we hope that you give them plenty of love. Just, we, you know, folks, I always want to say, want to, and 99% of you do a great job, so I'm giving you a pat on the back. I'm saying great work. Thank you that 99% of you will attack the arguments and not the person, and we love that. That's fun. That's great, and it's a way of showing respect to our guests. I mean, they're not going to, you know, they enjoy the challenge, you know, so they're happy to have their arguments, uh, you could say, attacked, but like I said, we respect our guests, and we're thankful for them, and so we want to encourage you to not attack the person, and that's, again, only about 1%, but want to just reaffirm that and say thank you though so much for being here with us folks i want to say hi to y'all in chat and then tell you about these upcoming debates folks you don't want to miss this one let me feel i can barely hold myself back in terms of telling you about this see that bottom right of your screen next week next wednesday in particular so exactly one week away tom jump and vosh will be debating on the super straight debate folks that's going to be juicy to say the least and so if you haven't already click that subscribe button or if you're watching on twitter click that follow button as you don't want to miss that one folks it's going to be epic and so yeah folks if you didn't know we do actually have a twitch and so i'm going to throw that into the youtube live chat if you have been living in a cave on mars with your fingers in your ears and you didn't know that we have a twitch folks I want to encourage you check out our twitch which i am putting into the live chat right now that link is chilling out there and now i'm going to pin it to the top even of the chat and so you can find it there at the very top of the chat as well want to say thanks everybody for hanging out here though as that was so fun and i enjoyed this one so much and some debates you can probably tell where you're like james isn't in the chat interacting as much is there some oh sorry i feel like i pinned the wrong one but thank you oliver catwell for being here as well I said hi james lost my internet for a bit we're glad you're back though oliver and so Thanks for being here. And want to let you know, though, folks, I enjoyed this one so much. And that's why sometimes I'm in the chat less because I'm just it's so fun to listen to these. And so you guys, if you didn't know this as well, want to mention, we hope it's useful. Now, maybe you're like, oh, James, not to me. However, that's hard to believe. You've been hanging out here, a lot of you, for about two hours. And that's why I am so confident you will actually enjoy this. In particular, Modern Day Debate is available on podcast. So I want to encourage you folks, if you haven't yet, pull out your phone right now. We right now have Modern Day Debate available. And you can see right there, those, that's just a list of our sweet debates. I'll let you know about some of the most juicy ones that we've had as of late. So we just released this three days ago. This was between T-Jump and Arden of Eden debating whether or not Dawkins' recent tweet back in April 
was transphobic. So that was a juicy one. We got a lot of political ones on there if you do enjoy political. And then we, of course, have a lot of our kind of our flagship topic is debates on religion, theism, atheism, everything under the, the umbrella of philosophy of religion plus even creation evolution but we also have seven days ago we had uploaded the capitalism versus socialism debate that was a tag team debate and so folks want to encourage you if you've already downloaded or i should say if you've already subscribed to modern day debate in your favorite podcast app hey if you give us a like or a subscription or any sort of positive feedback that helps us as we really do appreciate that in your favorite podcast app but good to see you and say hello to you Gabriel Real, thanks for coming by. And Brian Griffin, we're glad you're here, as well as Cameron Roberts. And 49 Hamburger, thanks for coming by. And Ordinary G32, thanks for dropping in with us. The Minor Prophet, glad you're here. And Michael Lyon, thanks so much for your kind words. As much love, brother. Thank you so much, Michael Lyon. I appreciate that, seriously. And I know there are a few super chats, forgive me, folks. I There might have been one from you, Michael, is that. A lot of times is that our, our debaters, they are, especially tonight, that was a high-profile debate. I mean, these guys are respected academics, and uh, I, I just really appreciate that we have them on for the time that we do. And so I was trying to keep my promise in terms of what I had originally promised for how long it would go. And so that's why, if, if for real, folks, like, I don't blame you. I'd be open to it. If you ever were like, dang, James, you didn't read my super chat. I'm available at modernadebate at gmail.com. And if you let me uh, know your Venmo, I can actually send it back. Because I, I do know that you guys send in a super chat with the uh, anticipation that it'll be asked. And so I want to keep that promise. And when I don't, I, I'm happy to say, hey, well, you know, I can send it back. And I'm sorry about that. And so I know that uh, Michael Lyon, I think there was one from you I missed. And then there was, uh, I think, several from Sphincter of Doom. <laughs> sorry, Sphincter of Doom. Bubblegum Gun, also, I'm really sorry. I skipped, like, ugh, sorry, we skipped several of yours. So I am uh, genuinely moderndaydebate at gmail.com. Reach out to me. We'll connect, and I'll, I'll try to make it up to you. And so thank you for being here, though. Folks, want to let you know whether you super chat or not, whether you even hit that like button or not. Although, hey, we appreciate it if you want to hit that like button. Just for hanging out here, thanks. I want to let you know, folks, if you are new to Modern Day Debate, we want to let you know, no matter what walk of life you were from, whether you be Christian, atheist, Democrat, Republican, Republican, gay, straight, black, white, Trump supporter, Biden supporter, you name it, folks. We just want to let you know that we hope you feel welcome. So thanks for hanging out with us. And we are excited about the future, folks, as I've been encouraged. Folks, thanks so much for your encouragement and just the fact that modern day debate has, uh, thanks to you, it's been growing and it's honestly just awesome things have been happening in terms of doors that have been opening up, new things that we're excited about. I want to show you this interesting debate that we're scheduling for next month. This is one that it's a kind of a work in progress. It's not that easy to find people that hold all these different positions. The funny thing is right now I have two people who argue, they, they want to argue that that the JFK assassination was not what it appears to be. Namely, you could say that they kind of take the conspiracy version of explaining the JFK assassination. I have two people that are in that camp. I don't have anybody who's in the opposing camp. So if you want to come on and debate that topic, if you have prior debate experience, that definitely is, you could say, a preferred qualification. A necessary qualification is we are getting more stringent on asking people to use their camera as it is it's a YouTube debate channel on YouTube. It's not talk radio. So we do ask people if they're willing to use their camera. And we're not trying to, I'm not trying to put anybody down if they don't like to use their camera. We have people that we still make exceptions. Like people who, an example would be like Team Skeptic has always helped out the channel. Really loyal guy. And I want to be loyal to Team. So I don't mind if Team doesn't use his camera sometimes. And so, uh, but you know, so we, uh, it's like, those are people people that have helped us out in the past. But Sam Miller, good to see you. Thanks for coming by as well. And Pancake of Destiny, we're glad you're here. As well as as well as well Louis Preciado, good to see you again. And Red Ames Odd said, yeah, let's see. Got called a country fried clown. Well, that is an interesting I've never heard that one. Amazing. I'll have to start calling you that. <laughs> country fried clown. But yes, good to see you. Benjamin. Thanks for coming by. Seriously, said, wow, a debate on Dawkins 
tweet being T, shaking my head, sheesh. I know it is. Uh, it's a juicy one, that's for sure. And folks, yeah, it's you know. Well, I can't. I always have to remain neutral. Our goal at Modern Day Debate is to be a neutral. I, so I will never say what positions I'm on. Some of you know, like a, some of my views that you know, I'm I'm not really like what's the word I'm looking for. I don't strongly strive to like cover up all of my views, but I also will never make a video that is like here's the case for. X, Y, or Z, and where it's just that type of video. Don't get me wrong. I think that's cool if other channels do it. Like, totally cool. But we, when we started Modern Day Debate, we were like, hey, we're going to have this be kind of unique, kind of different, and that it will literally be only debates. Like, there's no other videos where I might be like, well, but what's the channel's, like, goal or vision? Believe me, I am always ready to state our vision. Folks, do you remember what the vision is? Namely, we want to provide a level playing field to everybody so that everybody can make their case on that level playing field, no matter what walk of life they're from. And so we're a neutral platform doing just that, and we're excited about it. But Elijah Giles says, beta! Thanks for being with us, Elijah. What the? But yeah, I'm excited. Human Girl says, gotta go. Bye. Goodbye, Human Girl. Take care. And thanks for your kind words. And Hacks, who says, I can confirm Modern Day Debate even tolerates Australians. Yep, we do. We go that far, and, and I'm teasing you. My dearest Australian friends, it's fun when I look at the YouTube stats as well as the podcast stats that both, I'm so encouraged that people from all over the world watch, well, not all over the world, but like, like you'd be surprised. Like I'm, I'm surprised when I, like once in a while there's a country I like, I've like, I haven't heard of that country. So it is really cool. You guys, isn't it amazing? The internet allows us to have this show all over the world where it's it's having an impact on people from all over and so that is super encouraging want to let you know folks if you're from another country we really do appreciate you hanging out with us as you know we americans aren't that bad I mean, you know uh, actually you know i i always love that i've gotten and i'm encouraged by this that when i've traveled i've always gotten positive feedback where most people they're like, oh, no, we love we love Americans. Like, American people are friendly, and they're just always smiling. I mean, if anything, they don't like us because we smile too much. But one thing is, it's funny, though, that it's like they're like, hey, we're not always crazy about your government. And like, hey, you know, we as Americans can sympathize with that. The funny thing is, and that's the, the funny thing, too, is I've, I've also found that when I've traveled, the universal thing that I found across countries is everybody doesn't like their government. And it's in no way to mean that their arguments or their, you could say, complaints are not justified. In fact, like some places I've been, I was like, wow, I'd hate your government too. <laughs> but the idea is, it's interesting that uh, it's, but yes, long story short, thanks for watching no matter where you're from. And thanks for your super chat coming in from Michael Lyons says, you've always been cool with, been cool with James, even though you know I'm flat earth, love the channel, brother. Thanks for your kind words. Seriously, that really does mean a lot. And we do. I mean, that's the thing. I have, I mean, like, some channels, they're like, oh, we're all about tolerance and we're all about fairness. And, like, we're, like, radicals about it. I mean, we're like, hey, yeah, we'll, we'll host a flat earth debate and we're not going to take a stance on it. Like, we'll let the debaters make their case. And some people are like, oh, it's so irresponsible. Would somebody please think of the children? And I'm like, seriously, uh, really? I mean, first of all, I'm like, geez, if this is the worst thing you've experienced this week, your life must be a lot easier than mine. But the other thing is I'm like, you know, you always, a lot of these people that complain about the fact that we give everybody a fair shot. Like I said, we'll give flat earthers a fair shot. We'll give uh, these controversial, tonight's like, I would say mildly controversial. We've hosted some political debates that, on social issues that were enough to where I worried. I was like, oh, we're, we're risking our first strike on YouTube. And the idea is some people, oh, oh, it's like that or Flat Earth too. Amazing. I'm just amazed at some of the stuff we get in terms of crap for hosting Flat Earth, for platforming Flat Earthers in general. I'm like, oh, gee, oh, it's so bad. But the idea is when people are so triggered by that, and I'm like, are you for real? The same people that many of these are like, oh, we're all about tolerance and all views are accepted. And it's like, well, you, you're it's pretty clear that's just tongue in cheek. Like you, you don't want, you like openly will say that you don't want us to give a fair shake to some people. 
right? Like some views, they'll say like, this is, this is irresponsible. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, R- really? Like, I, like you openly say you don't want some views to be allowed on here. And I, you know, I'm sick folks. I'm really sick. Cause it just makes you want to do it more when they do that on Twitter. So I just, <laughs> you know, the, the funny thing too is I tell people, I, I want to say thank you though, everybody for your support. And I also want to say thank you to the people who make a fuss on Twitter because I know that you guys don't do this, but the cool thing is we've got the wind to our back, folks. Modern day debate is just going to keep growing. And the reason I say that is not only do we have all of you who are like, seriously, thank you for your support and making this channel awesome with your ideas, just being here and being fun and, and just love your amazing Oliver Catwell says in the chat, just making it fun. Like I enjoy this. This is a time when I'm doing my PhD and sometimes I like reading all day is oftentimes like my job. And so like seriously, like reading peer reviewed, like technical stuff where I'm like, sometimes if it's history stuff, it's so hard. Long story short, this channel is fun for me. And it's, it's so fun that I, I love getting to do it. And long story short, what I was going to say though, is when people make a stink on Twitter, as of now, I never fire back. And there's two reasons. One, I always think, well, if someone's like trying to trash modern day debate on Twitter, I can, rather than getting into some Twitter feud, I can actually go out and try to improve the channel. I can invite like new guests or try to think of new topics, whatever it is. The other thing is I don't want to discourage them. They probably don't know. Oftentimes when they trash us on Twitter, we actually, I can see like in the creator studio, we get an influx of traffic from Twitter. (laughs) So like, I think, I mean, the, sometimes it might be true. I don't know. I don't think it's true. It can't, it can't be true all the time. That's one thing I've learned in philosophy is that I, I think that you can almost never say never. Namely that if you think like, oh, in all cases, X is the case. And I'm like, ah, there's always some counter example that's going to be a bugger. So there's, there's extremely rare cases of where you can say like, nope, it's just always the case that X. However, I will say generally it seems to be true that there's not really much, uh, it, there's, it's rare that there's such a thing as bad publicity. Cause when we do get trashed, uh, some, sometimes somebody would do like some cheap shot on Twitter and like, Oh, modern day debate being so irresponsible or dumb or whatever. And like I said, I was like, well, if you want to help us grow, you can always trash us on Twitter, but Hulk and break glad you were here. Sorry, you guys, thanks for letting me like rant. I know that you guys are like, James is like, just going on like he's like all all this pent up rage and and hacks says sunlight is the best disinfectant that's my thought folks obviously is that i'm always like hey you know what if an idea is really silly then assuming that the debaters which we we actually try to make make sure that they're you know roughly evenly matched and it's not always exactly the same every time but that yeah once these ideas get exposed and that's why we have that video because you might be thinking well james like i don't know well, if you check out this interesting video we put on the channel page, at our Modern Day Debate homepage, we have this channel video that says why we host controversial debates. It's got Steven Pinker, Harvard psychologist, and, you know, like, if you haven't heard of Steven Pinker, it's like, where have you been? He basically talks about the value of debate, because oftentimes people, and oftentimes these, you could say legitimately harmful ideas because there are it's true there are ideas that are harmful i don't deny that but the idea is he says when you don't allow debate a lot of people go down those rabbit holes and they never hear a response to the ideologies of these kind of you could say potentially harmful ideologies and so i don't like using the word problematic it's become i don't like the word problematic there's nothing wrong with it it's just that it's become cliche it's Oh, why X, Y, Z is problematic. I've just seen too many articles with that. It's They've ruined it. But Oliver Catwell, good to see you, and Mark Reed. And also Hannah Anderson, thanks for your support in the old live chat. And Bo Smith, thanks for coming by. He says, I'm a vampire in Transylvania. You serious? And you serious, Clark? How long? Good to see you. As well as Kassan, good to see you again. And... Benjamin says, glad modern day debate, tries to stay neutral. Can't imagine spending that much time on that particular matter. Thank you, Benjamin. We appreciate it. And raw nakedness has returned. 
Human Girl, I mean, it's like Clark Kent leaving and then Superman appears. Uh, there's raw nakedness who has appeared. But Gabriel Real, thanks for coming by, as well as Ozian. And folks, I'm excited, though, about the future. Believe me, we are absolutely thrilled for it. Don't bet against us. Modern Day Debate is going to keep growing, and it's because of you, and it's because, hey, we're excited about brand new stuff coming up at this channel. That stuff such as new topics, new guests. We do want to do some travel debates, like in-person debates this summer. That's on the list. We're excited about that. That makes it fun. People usually enjoy those. And then third finger from the right, good to see you, as well as <laughs> Radim's Odd quoting Jesse Lee Peterson in the whole live chat. And, uh, who else is here? James Montalbano. Thank you for coming by. We hope you are doing well. Thanks for being with us. And oh, let's see. Where is it? I'm catching up. Michael Lyons says, I did my PhD 10 years ago. That's rad, man. Really cool. And Invisible Ninja says, Modern Day Debate, the two live crew of debate shows. That's right. I know who you're talking about. Wasn't it like one of the only bands that was banned, no pun intended, by Congress like back in the 90s or something? But yes, it, that's the funny thing. I don't even think, I mean, there are there are some debates, like I'll admit, were like pretty controversial, but I think we're generally pretty like well-behaved in the YouTube world. There's a lot of like, there's a lot of stuff out there, folks. But Danny3648 says, you're also a greater entertainer, James. Really good company also. Thank you, Danny, for your kind words. Seriously, I appreciate that. Is Folks, I am... Um, well, actually, let me just ask, is there anybody new in the chat? Is this your first time? Let me know as we do like to say hi. And thank you, Platium, for linking the Discord. I'm going to pin that at the top of our chat. And I want to let you know, folks, we are pumped about the Discord. I have to give all of the credit to Platium and Larry Letts and others, MathPig. I have not done anything in Discord because I'm still trying to figure out how to use it. But I do want to say thank you so much to Platium and Larry Letts and MathPig and others who have made it rad. And that is linked at the top of the chat at the moment. It's also in the description box as always. And highly encourage you, if you have Discord, you can check it out. Let us know what you think. And Thank Platium while you're there, because we do appreciate Platium and others. Wilmar Castro, thanks for coming by, as well as Buddy Gordy, thanks for coming by. Says, I'm watching Ben's opening now. So that is juicy. I hope that you, uh, that's cool that you're, you won't hear me until, you're, it's going to be quite a while until you hear my voice in terms of uh, what I'm saying right now, if you ever hear it, but Thanks for being with us, buddy. And then Davos Holdos, thanks for being with us. Says, let the good times roll. Amazing. I couldn't agree more. And then Platium says, evening chat was awesome tonight. I'm so glad to hear that. And Twitch chat, so sorry, you guys, I'm behind. Thank you guys for being with us. CD Rank says, I'm new. Thank you, CD Rank, for letting us know that. And thanks for being here. Seriously, we're pumped to have you with us. And Tapazzo, good to see you there in the old live chat on Twitch. That's right. I'm checking in on you on Twitch, folks. Tapatzel and Brooke Sparrow, thanks for being with us, as well as Ozzy. And you still in there? But as well as Sideshow Nav, good to see you. And thanks, Sideshow Nav, for kind of taking – Sideshow Nav has put in, like, some serious, like, time and energy to help formulate kind of our ideas for the moderators in terms of the, kind of the plan or the strategy that we want to use for, for the moderators. And so I appreciate Sideshow Bob sacrificing that time as well and so thank you for your help and yeah lozenge good to see you as well as do work please thanks for coming by and the old youtube chat jumping back in good to see you kasan who says james thanks buddy love this channel and community thank you kasan seriously that means a lot and bo smith says james you rock thank you bo seriously i'm encouraged man i appreciate that and Eric, Michael Lyons says, Eric Dubai said he won't debate here. I'll see what I can do, get someone on another level, and will happen. That's funny. I mean, we never feel entitled to have any guest. So I, I don't know what it is about us. Maybe it's just because we're not that big yet. And some people may be like, but James, it is big. It's like, what is it? I think we're at like 46,000, I think 400 we just crossed over today. However, folks, I am thrilled about that. And I thank everybody for that. But we are excited as it's going to be 
modern day debate to infinity and beyond, folks. We are going to keep growing. And believe me, you guys think like, oh, man, 10 years. Are you for real? I mean, that's how long it took Joe Rogan to become monstrous. Believe me, I firmly believe modern day debate will become monstrous. And someday we are going to look back at this. And we will be, I mean, who knows? Maybe it's like several years from now, a few years from now. Maybe we're at something like maybe even 460,000, something like that, where it's like just significantly bigger and maybe just five years. And we'll be like, wow, remember when we were only 46,000? That was small. And so you're here early, folks. Believe me, this channel is going places. It's going to be bigger and badder than ever in the future. And Kassan says, can we... When can we expect the Raver edition of Modern Day Debate? I bet James would look pretty cool under blacklight. That would be pretty epic. I'll have to look into this, see if I can get that. That's funny. Gabriel Real, thanks for your support. Said, my first time here. Great channel. Gabriel, thanks so much for your encouragement. We're glad you're here. Thanks for hanging out with us. And said, wish you much success. Thank you, Gabriel. Seriously, it really is encouraging. And we're glad you're here. Thanks for your positivity. It's, an, it's refreshing. People like it. And... Brian Griffin says, that's right, James. Thank you for your kind words, Brian Griffin. appreciate that. And then Optics First says, this channel will never die. Well, people will always argue, that's a guarantee. You're right. And we are. We're going to adapt. We're going to reinvent ourselves. And we think it's not for the sake of change. Not just like, oh, we'll change because like change is like good. We are going to do it in a way that is like, when is it appropriate? When is it the right time to reinvent ourselves? And we're kind of right now looking, right now I'm looking for like ways that we can like freshen things up, liven things up, because now I have a little extra time over the summer. And so I'm excited about that. Things are key. You can say they're going to keep getting better. And so how long says banned in the USA? And Mr. P, good to see you. Said I ordered food, but I fell asleep. And sorry to hear though. Ooh, sorry to hear about that. And Han Anderson says Mathig left. He's not there. Oh man, I'm behind. Well, thank you for Mathig. Nonetheless, for all the work that Mathig has done, we do appreciate that help. And and Hacks says thank you, James Mods and guests and everyone in the audience. I agree, in Hacks. Thank you. Appreciate that. And Brooke Chavez says, did you say hi to the Twitch chat? I just did. Did you miss that? Maybe this is an old chat. I'm catching up. And then Kaysan says, thank you for tagging Heat Shield. Thanks for tagging the Discord for Kaysan. Kaysan. And Paradigm Shift Music says, thanks so much for another great debate. We got mad appreciation for you, James. Thanks for your kind words. Seriously, that means a lot. So this platform is awesome. Thank you. That's seriously encouraging. And I, I just appreciate all the positivity, folks, because, yeah, we I'm excited. We are changing the culture. Don't give up. I know that sometimes people are like, man, I, I've heard people say it sometimes, and it's like, hey, we're open to constructive criticism. So it is true. 99% of the people in the chat, they rock. They're positive. They'll attack the arguments instead of the person. That is awesome. However, at the same time, it is true that once in a while, there's like 1% who will sometimes attack the individual and it can seem discouraging because it's like oh there's a lot and it's like don't worry folks we're gonna get through this we are going to change the culture of modern day debate believe me we value fairness and we also value attacking the arguments rather than the person as we respect our guests and we appreciate our guests and so believe me that cultural change is happening it's improving it's getting better that's for sure i can already tell and that's something that's super encouraging to me and so thank you mods for doing a great job of we want to, I think the, the good thing too is thank you mods for echoing that message because it's, it's good for one person, for me to say the message and say, Hey folks, we want to encourage you to attack the arguments instead of the person. That's a good start. However, when moderators, when you guys do a great job as you have of carrying that message forward and saying, that's true. Like friendly reminder, folks want to encourage you to attack the arguments instead of the person that absolutely helps transform the culture as well because you guys are leaders here like we do appreciate you and people do consider that gabriel real said just subscribed thank you gabriel we're excited we appreciate you doing that and we are going to work hard to keep putting out excellent content this is you guys this is great like tonight was awesome and so we're excited about the fact that that's funny. Just saw an old friend from high school. Becky Stoddard, glad to see you. Thanks for coming by. Says, hi, Jimmy. That's right. I used to go by Jimmy all the time. Jimmy or Jim in high school, all the way up until, I say it was like 
only recently, what was it, when I went to Texas Tech, um, 2016? No, that couldn't be. It had to be earlier than that. 2014 was when I left. Yeah, so that's it. But anyway, you call me Jimmy or Jim. I'm cool with that. Good to see you, Becky Stoddard, in the live chat. Thanks. And then I forgot I've got it playing on Facebook tonight. So yeah, that's, <laughs> but thanks for coming by, Becky. And so yeah, folks, we're excited about it as it is going to be epic in the future. Tonight, I was thrilled. I mean, you guys, like these are like high profile debates. And I don't know if I had told you, yeah, we've got just a lot of upcoming juicy ones that you don't want to miss. So as I had mentioned, let me show you this one. Yeah, I had shown you guys, you don't want to miss this one. Believe me. You will be crying in your cornflakes if you miss this one. This one between Vosh and T-Jump, juicy, controversial. The stuff that you know deep down, you're sick like me, and you like it. You like the controversial topics. And there's nothing wrong with that, folks. Believe me. You enjoy it. I enjoy it. Everybody enjoys it. And so you don't want to miss this controversial debate that's coming up next Wednesday. So it's going to be a lot of fun, and we hope to see you there. And so... Good to see you as well. Bal Diablo, thanks for coming by. And then also Church of Entropy, glad you came by as well. So thanks, everybody. Invisible Ninja, good to see you there. Thanks, everybody, for your support. Love you guys. I hope you guys have a great rest of your night. Keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable, folks. And we will be back. In fact, what is it? Oh, it's Wednesday. So we'll be back Friday. You guys, let me show you this one. You guys maybe didn't know about this. You guys are like, hey, what do you mean you host like weird topics? I want to show you this. You don't want to miss it. I'm going to pull this in. Let me just click on image. <sighs> this Friday, I don't know if you guys have seen it on our course, or I should say not course page, um, on the Modern Day Debate homepage. You guys maybe haven't seen this yet because I just put it up right before this debate started. That's right. YouTube's favorite daughter, Erica, will be returning. She is on the right side of the screen. So Erica will be returning this Friday. Gutsick Gibbon, as she's known on YouTube, she'll be debating Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum. That's going to be a juicy one. And this is going to be our last debate on Bigfoot. <laughs> so it's a fun topic, but we've got to give the, the Bigfoot debaters some rest. And so uh, we, are, we are excited about it. We appreciate it. But we know people like variety too. And so this is going to be the last time we do big the Bigfoot topic for a while, even though it is a fun topic. I love these debates. And I love Dr. Meldrum too. Really pleasant fellow. And Erica, like, yeah, I got nothing against Erica. No, I'm teasing. I actually love Erica. She's like my little sister or something. Look, what a geek. Look, look at her. But anyway, <laughs> just, just teasing. She's all right. So let me, let me tell you about that, that you don't want to miss. And then thanks for your reminder. Someone just reminded me in the chat. Oh yeah, you're right. You guys, we are pumped about this one too. This is coming up shortly. Dr. Kenny Rose, Christian scholar, as well as apologist, will be debating the atheist juggernaut of a debater, Matt Dillahunty. Oh baby, it's going to be epic. That's coming up on June 5th. That is is on our YouTube homepage. And also though, folks, this is a crowdfund. So basically I had promised the speakers, these honorariums, and I had determined, I said, hey, yep, we'll get these to you. And I am absolutely determined to get these honorariums to our guests. As they have basically, I mean, Matt in particular, as an example, has done a ton for this channel. In fact, a, probably like a fifth of the views, maybe even a quarter of the views for this channel have come from Matt. And so I want to encourage you folks, join the crowdfund with us. And hey, I mean, you guys might be wondering like, well, is like crowdfund is it like expensive, man. Like, I don't know about that. And you know, well, like, what does it entail? And it's like, well, let me show you because you might actually be surprised that you can join this crowdfund, which helps make this event actually happen is for the price of a cup of coffee. I mean, look at that. Just three bucks, folks, is the lowest tier which is like you can theoretically if you just want to throw a dollar in that helps too but three dollars is the suggested lowest tier and that helps us make this event possible and we want to show this to the public so that it's live streamed in front of the public we don't want to do it where you basically last time we had it such that 
You guys remember the last Kickstarter that we did with Dr. Michael Shermer? So that's on screen right now. Last time we did this, because we've successfully done this and it was epic, is last time we had it where if you wanted to watch it live, if you threw a few bucks into the Kickstarter at minimum, or the crowdfund, I should say, then you know you could watch it live. We'd give the link out on the crowdfund page. We are considering doing that. If, if not a lot of people sign up to where we're like, okay, we're kind of getting nervous where we might do that. But so far, I'm pretty optimistic that this one will be public as of right now. I'm excited that I think that the live show will be public. But remember, I mean, we still need people to throw into the crowdfund to make it happen. And so if you want to... If you want to support the channel, if you're like, hey, this is the way I want to say, like, hey, thanks, Modern Day Debate. You guys have been fun. I've appreciated what you guys have done. Like, that's a way of showing that appreciation. And really, it does mean a lot. As You guys, this opens opportunities and doors for us. As, as we successfully do, you could say, as we successfully utilize this crowdfund strategy, I'm not joking. I'm serious. Like, I, I'm kind of hoping to get, like, our next kind of level of guest debaters like i've heard that dawkins would be outside of our crowdfund price range but like richard dawkins is somebody that i have on my list of people that we want to host as well as maybe like sam cedar and crowder like if if steven crowder and sam cedar were willing to do a debate and we said hey like imagine this folks let's say the next crowdfund because the last one you remember we raised over three grand and that helped us ensure that we could have inspiring philosophy debate Michael Shermer, the New York Times best-selling author, as well as president of Skeptic Magazine. That was an epic headliner event. And if this strategy is successful, which we believe it will be, we think we can keep increasing this because the subscribers are growing. I mean, when we did the first one, I think we had 30,000. No, we had, I think it was like, yeah, we didn't even have 40,000 subscribers. So we have 6,000 more people now that are potentially willing to kind of throw in for the Kickstarter or I should say the crowdfund. And so like we're determined folks, like we are absolutely determined. We're going to make it. I don't care if me and T jump have to do a car wash out in May. I mean, let me, I don't know if you guys want to see this, but I'll show you the picture from the last car wash that me and T jump did. I mean, I don't know. Maybe you like that, but I can tell you, you maybe don't. We are excited folks. And I don't care if, me and T-Jump and Steven Steen have to go out and do a car wash in order to make this happen. We are going to reach our goal for the fundraiser. And so we're excited to consider joining with us. That crowdfund is linked in the description. I'll throw it into the chat as well. But yeah, we've successfully done it. That's the picture that you're seeing on screen right now. And want to let you know though, folks, we have these epic perks. And so, for example, I showed you, you know, it's three bucks just to make the event happen. That helps. Appreciate that. And then the next tier is six dollars. That just helps us do some promo as we want to kind of put the word out for the debate. In other words, like we want to publicize it. And then also your name on screen is the next tier. But some of these are really cool as I'm excited. Let me show you these. So these are new ones. Namely, at the top right of your or the top of your screen, the Modern Day Debate Coffee Mug 25. That's a cool perk, folks. What is cooler than your own Modern Day Debate Coffee Mug? As well as the next tier, an embossed postcard, and then Modern Day Debate T-shirt. We're excited that that's been a popular one. So it's at least four. It might be more people that have signed up now. And I know that the temptation is to, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, you're you're probably like me where you are kind of like, well, I'll probably throw into the crowdfund maybe in the last day. But it does help us like plan to know, like, for example, if we're really behind on the day before the event, that's when I might go reach out to some people who, like, because there are people who have said like, hey, if you have a crowdfund or something like that and you look like you're in trouble, like reach out to me, like let me know. So it helps like me to know like where we're planning in terms of how many people are excited to jump into the crowdfund. And if you haven't done it before, you might be like, oh man, I'd love to get a modern day debate, t- modern day debate t-shirt plus help make sure this event happens. Want to let you know it's a piece of cake, folks. So let me show you on screen right now. You, to jump into Indiegogo and help support the crowdfund, you don't even have to have your own, like you don't have to, what's the word I'm looking for? You don't have to create an account 
with Indiegogo. You can just breeze on through the opening by signing in with Facebook. So if you have a Facebook, I mean, hey, like a piece of cake. I mean, you can jump in that fast. And so I want to let you know, like, it's pretty darn convenient in terms of signing up. And if you've never done your own crowd, like if you've never been a part of a crowd fund before, I would encourage you like, oh, it's fun, folks. Like it's just kind of a fun little, little you know, like little way of uh, making an event possible. And I showed you guys already. I have, uh, last was it December, it was the first time that I was part of a crowd fund. And I mostly did this. <laughs> don't tell Brenton, it'll break his heart. I love Brenton. So if he's listening right now, Brenton, don't feel hurt. I, I love it. And I'm going to save it forever. Like I'm, I'm really thankful for this. I'm not a huge comic book guy, but I did it because I wanted to support Brenton because Brenton, this is Snow White Zombie Apocalypse. Brenton makes comics and they're not, they have no political like stance or anything. So I'm not trying to push anybody's, you know, certain beliefs, but I appreciate Brenton so much. And so I want to let you know that uh, basically I had done this in terms of Brenton uh, wanting to support Brenton as we really, I, I appreciate him. And so he's, by the way, you guys didn't know. So like Dr. Humor, the way we got connected to Dr. Humor was through Brenton. The way that we got connected to Dr. Friedman was through Brenton. Like, and so anyway, well, thankful to Brenton. A lot of people think like, oh man, like, well, anyway, long story short. So yeah, uh, jump it back into the old chat. Kassan, have a great night, said later, Gators. Thank you for coming by. And CD, good to see you in the old chat again. And Reverend Arrow, thanks for coming by, said there is a Discord mod chat. There is. The moderators have chats in there where they talk about like the rules and kind of problem solving. And like somebody, let's say somebody says something in chat and they're like, does this break the rules? And they're like, ah. And so they'll kind of like as a group discuss it. And then Brian Griffin says, out of the 10 months, 10 most viewed videos on this channel, Matt is in nine of them. That's true. And that's why we're like, we want to say thank you to Matt as Matt has helped this channel grow a lot. And we really do appreciate that. And then Reverend Arrow said, maybe $50 if I get a t-shirt. Not only that, but remember folks, you don't just get everything at the tier that you sign up for. You get everything below that tier as well. So if you signed up for, let's say the t-shirt, you get not only the t-shirt, but also the modern day debate coffee mug. Pretty cool. And then also like the modern day debate, like the event postcard that we send out with the embossed modern day debate logo on it. And then your name on screen, like you get all of that. So I should, man, I don't, I don't think I mentioned that enough because that's something that's actually like really important and I should mention it. And I'm going to write that down right now, namely mention you get all the perks below the perk you sign up for as well. So yeah, I mean, yeah, let's say you did modern day debate t-shirt and like you get the mug, coffee mug, you get your name shouted out on screen at the end of the event, the event. So I'm like, man, you guys like, it's pretty awesome. And coffee zealot. Thanks for coming by. Appreciate you hanging out with us. And then they said, where is the link to donate? I can't find it. Oh, you're right. Oh, sorry about that. Let me get that out of the, uh, out of the description box. So it is in the description box, I think, unless I forgot. Oh no, I forgot. Oh my gosh, you guys, I'm sorry. Oh, I can't believe I forgot. I thought I checked it right before this debate, but it was another one. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab that link for you right now. And I'm so sorry that I completely miffed on that. So I didn't get a lot of sleep last night, but I am excited nonetheless about this event. And so it's going to be epic. And I am excited though. Somebody actually just made a contribution today. It was like, it was like five o'clock or so. And so the the uh, the crowdfund Indiegogo asked us not to, they asked me not to like share people's names. So I can't, um, can't name them, but I can say thank you to the person who did give today. And so we're excited about that, though. And thank you, Reverend Arrow, for your support of that next Matt Dillahunty debate. And then, oh, Fish Frog Dolphin says, when is debate again? It is on the 29th. So Saturday, the 29th, folks, you really do. You don't want to miss it. It's seriously, it's going to be really cool. It is worthy of the name debate again, not just because it is. Not just because it's 12 hours. It's going to be a 12-hour stream. So if you, for some reason, 
want to stare at me for 12 hours straight, I will be there on Saturday the 29th starting at 9.30 in the morning mountain time. So 11, or no, let me, 9.30, it's 9.30 in the morning. Um, no, no, no. Eastern time? 9.30 in the morning, my time. Yes, that's right. Uh, which is 11.30. So 11.30 a.m. Eastern time. We will start. And it'll go till 11.30 p.m. Eastern time. So it'll be a full 12 hours. And so you don't want to miss that, folks. It's going to be a juicy one. And I can tell you the debates within it are going to be awesome as well. And so we're still finalizing one or two of them, but it's going to be really cool. And Brooke Chavez says, you have two debates booked for the 21st. Thanks for letting me know that. I think I forgot. I must have just, sometimes when I, you guys probably have noticed this, sometimes a debate will pop up on one day debate and then it'll be like, wait, why does it say that it's going to be right now? And it's like, ah, it's because I put the wrong date and the time. <laughs> so thanks for letting me know about that. And that crowdfund though is linked in the chat and I'm going to throw it into the description right now. So thanks for your, wait a minute. Even, oh, where I'm like baffled because I updated, I updated this this morning. I know I did. And for some reason right now, yeah, because I know I put Dr. Michael Humer's second link in this morning. I must not have saved it. I don't know what was going on, but the crowd, crowd fund link. Okay, that is now in the description box. And so if you want to access it that way as well, you can. So I want to say thanks, everybody, for all of your support, though. Thanks for making this channel great. Thanks for, I'm excited about the future, folks. We've got, and that's the thing, too, is I know that some people are like, man, I don't, you know, like, I don't know about this debate regarding the crowdfund. But, you know, maybe if you got, like, somebody epic in the future. Like, I know some people are like, if you got Steven Crowder and Sam Cedar, then, oh, baby, I would sign up for that crowdfund in an instant. And I'm like, well, I want to encourage you to consider this. We do plan on doing those types of debates in the future. Want to let you know. If you're just like, hey, just throw $3 into this current crowdfund, that lets us know that the strategy works. Is that if you're just like, eh, $3, I mean, it's less than a cup of coffee, right? And it's like, eh, it's like, no big deal. You know, a lot of people like they're, you know, they'll like, a, let's say they put in a super chat for like $5. And they're like, eh, it's like $3. Like, is that if you throw in on it, that helps us know that it's a strategy that like we can have more confidence in. And thus, when we get to the point of like, oh, Richard Dawkins, like how much would he, what, what is, what would his honorarium be? I'm going to be more likely to say like, yep, people are like consistently, they dig the crowdfund. And even if they just throw a few bucks in, like, eh, I, you know, we have people that support it. So thanks everybody. We appreciate you. We love you guys. Thanks for making this a blast. And so it really is a true pleasure to have you. So we hope you all keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable. We're excited about the future and thanks everybody. We will see you on Friday. Welcome to the show. It's Friday. Thanks everybody.